The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Glover, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Today I appear with Ms Spees. We will commence this morning's hearing by playing a short video. Um, just before that is done, may I mention that this shows firefighting scenes and scenes of a bushfire. It may be distressing for some viewers. It runs for approximately 3 minutes and 26 seconds. What, don't let it cross the road or are we going in there? Uh, Alright, well there's quite a few embers mate. We had a spot over there, couldn't get to the other one. Out of there and into Blackhead Road and then to go up the other end of High Street where the houses are and take a look in behind them. Over. So Glover, thank you for that. That truly shows what faces our volunteers out there during the bushfire season and the professionalism within which they uh, they go th go into the fight to uh, to protect the community. So, thank you. Yes, Chair. Um, just for context, that uh, video was taken by a volunteer firefighter at Point Halliday, which is located about midway between Tari and Foster on the mid-north coast of New South Wales. And as the footage uh, disclosed, it was taken on the 26th of October 2019. The video captures what is described in emergency management appropriately as the response phase. 
The aim of the response phase is to save lives, protect property, and make areas affected by a natural disaster safe. Central to the response phase in a bushfire context are firefighters and their equipment. Firefighters are the first responders. Of course, the same can be said of state emergency services and other emergency services personnel and their equipment in responding to cyclones, floods and other natural disasters. In order to explore the response phase as it relates to your terms of reference A, B and F, on 19 June 2020, the Royal Commission published an issues paper titled Firefighting and Emergency Services Personnel and Equipment. The issues paper provided an opportunity to hear directly from the public about these issues. In her opening to this week's hearing on Tuesday, Ms Hogan Doran stated, hearing from everyone, in particular all firefighters or emergency services personnel, is not possible. Yet praise for their contribution to the response effort was almost universal. The Royal Commission invited responses to 10 questions by 29 June 2020. Those questions related to how personnel are recruited, trained and supported before, during and after the emergency, how equipment is managed, how personnel coordinate during an emergency, how organisations share resources, what post event assessment and reporting frameworks are in place and whether the Australian Government has a greater role to play in such emergency management frameworks. As of this morning, the Royal Commission has received 45 responses to the issues paper, including responses from individuals, brigades, organisations and government. I now propose to summarise for your assistance the key themes arising from those responses. In relation to training, responses noted that national competencies already exist for firefighters under the Public Safety Training Package, which has been established since the year 2000 and reviewed most recently in 2019. However, responses indicate that fire and emergency services have different training systems and expectations for these supposed national competencies. This challenge is explained by the Australasian Fire and Emergency Services Authorities Council, AFAC, in its response which stated, while transferability of these qualifications is guaranteed under the rules governing the use of the standards for RTOs, that is registered training organisations, in practice this often, in, this often proves challenging. While recognition of prior learning, RPL, also exists, it is a persistent view within some agencies that it is easier to redo a qualification or unit than it is to undertake recognition of prior learning. Other responses also suggest firefighters desire training that is recognised and transferable within and across states and territories, and practical training regimes that account for the differences between geography and the needs of career and volunteer firefighters. In relation to equipment, responses emphasised the need and urgency for a common communication platform for first responders. Responses urged that these platforms be made available to first responders irrespective of the agency or jurisdiction they belong to. Responses suggest the benefits of a common platform would extend beyond bushfires and would apply to all types of natural disasters. One response recounted a personal experience of being deployed interstate without compatible communication equipment during the 2019 20 bushfires, stating, CFA crews could not interact with any of the New South Wales counterparts during their deployments with their own appliances. This on its own was extremely dangerous. Previously, communication vans were deployed with task forces. This did not occur this past season. If CFA crews were using RFS appliances, there was still extreme difficulty communicating during deployments. 
Some encouraged the delivery of a public safety mobile broadband capability, about which we heard some evidence yesterday, while others were more cautious, suggesting that such a capability will not be the answer to the communication issues in the field. In any event, responses suggested broad consensus that reliable and compatible communications equipment is vital to responding to natural disasters. On the subject of equipment more generally, some responses suggested the need to improve asset management with a view of sustainably maintaining and replacing equipment in a timely manner. Responses noted the impact the lack of interoperability has on resource sharing and coordination. One response from a volunteer firefighter spoke of the difficulties he faced as a volunteer firefighter deployed to South Australia. He stated, as a volunteer firefighter, it would, have, it would be nice to know that I can get into a, an appliance type in another state and it's the same as the one I've been using in my state. He goes on to say, different suppliers of radio, different systems, different frequencies and different protocols all add to the inability to communicate effectively on the fire ground. Further issues related to resource sharing were also raised, including concerns that decisions are made without sufficient consultation at the brigade level, resulting in inappropriate resources being dispatched. In relation to volunteers, responses acknowledged that significant contribution volunteers made to all aspects of fire and emergency services during the 2019-20 bushfire season. Many responses note the need for improved training for volunteers. Responses suggest that inefficient training leads to limitations in the skills and operational roles for volunteers. Other responses suggested the need for greater involvement of volunteers in decision-making processes and incident management teams to ensure volunteer perspectives are considered and valued. Responses considered that, while wellbeing support is available to all emergency services personnel, these services could be improved. Understandably, first responders suggest that they continue to suffer the after effects of their contributions to the 2019-20 bushfires. One volunteer detailed his crew's experience as part of the Balogi Rural Fire Brigade in Queensland, saying, the fire jumped my crews and trucks at Wigton in December. The crews are jumpy and members have told me they are too stressed to go back. And Wigton, for some context, is a rural locality in the South Burnett local government area in Queensland located around Kingaroy. In relation to incident management, responses were supportive of the use of the Australasian Inter-Service Incident Management System, known as AIMS, about which the Commission has already received some evidence. AIMS is, of course, endorsed by AFAC. Based on the responses, AIMS appears to be an effective structure through which incidents can be managed, but responses suggest the structure only works effectively when the people involved have sufficient training and expertise. Some responses suggest the need for greater investment in incident management team training and encourage the use of mentoring for such roles. Responses suggest that interagency collaboration worked well on the fire ground, but was less present within incident management teams and control centres. Responses suggest interagency relationships at this level need to be strengthened in preparation for emergency events. Multiple responses discuss challenges that arose from decision making occurring far away from the fire ground. Responses emphasise the need for timely, two-way communication and decision-making between the control centres and the personnel on the fire ground. Turning then to post-event assessment for accountability. Responses suggest that reviews or inquiries are commonplace, although personnel who worked on the ground felt that recommendations were not always acted upon or implemented. Some responses suggest greater oversight is required to ensure public safety agencies implement outcomes and recommendations. 
In addition, others suggest the need for greater involvement of those personnel who were on the ground in the review process. One response suggests post-event assessment and reporting frameworks generally operate at high levels and exclude fire ground managers and personnel who were on the coal face. This is the main reason that we tend to go backwards. Finally, while most responses welcomed the idea that the Australian government could play a bigger role, many had different views about the type of role the Australian government should play. The types of roles that responses suggest the Australian government could adopt included encouraging the adoption of common standards across states and territories for certain training or equipment, providing more funding for initiatives, coordinating national policy settings, coordinating national response to fires, including the facilitation of interstate resource movements and the tracking of the location of assets, and simplifying processes to expedite on the ground decision making. It almost goes without saying that the responses to the issues paper represent just some of the extraordinarily diverse views that are held in this space. And that brings us to today's witnesses. We will hear further insights on these topics from three panels representing volunteer firefighting organisations and rural fire brigades. Volunteers are integral to Australia's response to all forms of natural disasters. They are drawn from communities all around Australia. They give their time selflessly and bring life skills to protect life and property, many knowing it could be them in need of help next time. All of today's witnesses are volunteer firefighters. None of them are legally represented. For that reason, they have not been required to give witness statements to the Commission. Instead, we will hear from them in three panels. The first two panels will be made up of volunteer firefighting associations from across Australia, which will take us to lunch. After lunch, we will hear a range of perspective from five volunteer firefighters from volunteer brigades across Australia. This, of course, is just one subset of volunteer firefighters. In some states, there are other groups of volunteers who band together, such as farm firefighting units. They, too, are vital to response efforts. We can expect to hear the complex range of interests at play in relation to these topics and the topics canvassed in the in issues paper from these witnesses. It is important to emphasise these panels are not the only word or indeed the last word for the Commission on these topics. The Commission will continue to inquire into these important topics. It is anticipated that in the coming weeks the Commission will hear further evidence on these topics from other perspectives. Before I call the first handle, uh, sorry, before I call the first panel, I will tender the relevant documents. I tender documents 16.1 through 16.4 in the tender list as notified to the parties with leave to appear. Documents 16.1.1 through 16.1 relate to the Volunteer Fire Brigades of Victoria. Document 16.2.1 is an extract of the Productivity Commission Report on Government Services, specifically Part D Section 9, which contains data tables for emergency services for fire and other events. Document 16.3 are a series of photographs provided by the members of this afternoon's panel. And document 16.4 is the video that was played at the commencement of today's hearing. We'll take those documents, photographs and videos as exhibits as marked. Thank you. Thank you. The first panel comprises representatives from the Australian, uh, apologies, the first panel comprises representatives from the Council of Australian Volunteer Fire Associations, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Association and Volunteer Fire Brigades Victoria. I now call Andy Wood, Brian McDonough 
and Adam Barnett. They will be giving their evidence concurrently. Gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining us on a Friday morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Good morning. Um, I will start with Mr Wood, who will take an affirmation. Mr Wood, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. I will next go to Mr McDonough. Mr McDonough. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And my apologies, Associate, all three uh, members of the panel will take an affirmation, so that leaves us with Mr Barnett. Mr Barnett, mm -hmm. do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for agreeing to give evidence today. I would like to commence by asking you a little bit about your organisations and a little bit about you, given you are all volunteer firefighters as well. Uh, Mr Wood, can I start with you? and ask you a little bit about the Council of Australian Volunteer Associations. Yes, uh, um, yes. The, um, the Council was um, set up um, some years ago now. Um, it's comprised of 11 um, associate members um, from, around the, from around the country. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> um, the reason that, uh, that there's 11 is that some states have more than one association representing their, their volunteer structures. Um, we, are, we set up in a, how can I explain it? It's a fairly, it's a fairly loose arrangement. We are not uh, there to dictate in any way to, uh, to our members of how things, um, how things should be. We're there to work collaboratively, collaboratively with them. Um, to uh, to assist in advancing their um, you know their their organisations and their cause, I guess um, we're there to identify anything that may be better dealt with at a federal level and and to assist with that. Can you just give us an idea of the number of volunteer firefighters your members represent, please? This is a little difficult. Um, we have always worked on the numbers of approximately 250,000, bearing in mind that some states record their numbers of volunteers slightly differently, and bearing in mind also that some states, it's not compulsory for the volunteers within an organisation to be members of the association. Thank you. And so, Mr Wood, just staying with you for the time being, uh, you're a South Australian and you also have a role in the South Australian Volunteer Firefighting Association, is that right? Yes. And, and uh, I am currently the state. Oh, apologies, sorry, you sorry, just cut out then. Yeah, what's your role in the association? I'm currently the state president of the South Australian Country Fire Service Volunteer Association. And what's your role in the Council of Australian Volunteer Firefighting Associations? I am um, president. Thank you. And so just about yourself, you're a volunteer firefighter? I am indeed. Um, I'm a brigade captain at American River Brigade on Kangaroo Island, um, just off the south coast of South Australia. And did you participate in fighting the fires on Kangaroo Island in the 2019-2020 bushfire season? I did. Thank you. Um, I'll go to you next, Mr McDonough. Um, can I just ask you about the New South Wales Rural Fire Service Association? Can you please describe the association and its members? Uh, yes, the uh, Rural Fire Service Association uh, was set up in 1997 um, as a result of the um, uh, formation of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and uh, an organisation called the Bushfire 
um, Fire Control Officers Association, which was the, the previous um, salaried organisation, which was a, a conglomeration of council-run um, organisations, uh, decided to include volunteers in their organisation and set up the Rural Fire Service Association. So we now are an organisation of some 47,900 members of the Rural Fire Service, both salaried and um, volunteer. And we look, uh, basically pursue the interests of uh, those members of our organisation um, with the, both with the Rural Fire Service and with the uh, government uh, and other bodies. And um, just a little bit about yourself personally, you are an RFS volunteer, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm an RFS volunteer in the Tenterfield Shire in the north of New South Wales and uh, a group officer and was heavily involved in um, countless number of the 600 odd fires that we had during the last season up there, as well as uh, serving um, a couple of days down in Albury uh, on a, on a uh, task force that went down there. Thank you. Um, Mr Barnett, can you please describe for the Commission the Victorian Association? Yeah, thank you, Mr Clapper. So I'm the CEO of Volunteer Fire Brigades Victoria. So we are recognised and formed under the CFA Act. So under Section 6, our job is to represent um, and perform the role of the elected representatives of CFA volunteers for both the authority, government and instrumentalities. Um, and under Section 100 of the CFA Act, our job is to notify the CFA Board of issues affecting CFA volunteers' welfare and efficiency. How many members of your organisation do you have? So we, we represent all CFA volunteers. So as of 30th of June um, this year, there are 53,311 CFA volunteers. And then we provide an opportunity for both brigades and groups to exercise a voluntary contribution to the running costs of the association. And approximately 94% of brigades elect to make a voluntary contribution to the association. Am I right to say, just hearing from your evidence about the association, that the structures um, relating to it are a little more formalised in Victoria than they may be in other states? I would say that most of the states follow a very similar pathway. So uh, certainly along the eastern seaboard, um, where I've got a fair amount of familiarity, um, it's quite similar. I think you'll find a difference between fire associations and other um, um, emergency associations. And it's, it's because of our size and our breadth and diversity of our membership. So we have very formal structures in place to try and have peer review um, of, of what's affecting volunteers and also to provide very formal escalation pathways for issue resolution. When you're dealing with a membership of 53,000 people, um, the formalised structures are absolutely critical to try and sort out um, what may be an individual issue versus a trend or a theme that is coming up. Thank you. And so although you're the CEO of the association, um, you're also a volunteer firefighter as well. I am. So I've been a CFA volunteer for about 15 years, half of that time as a senior officer and a lieutenant of a busy um, urban brigade. Um, I operate um, in a brigade southeast suburbs of Melbourne and I'm a fully qualified structural and bushfire firefighter. Thank you. Um, just before we leave the organisations, so to speak, Mr McDonough, um, we obviously heard a lot over the summer period in 2019 and 20 about the enormous donations that were made to the Rural Fire Service Trust and what was to be done with those funds. Um, do you have any familiarity with the trust? Uh, yeah, yes, I do. Um, uh well, the RFSA, in fact, was invited to um, 
offer a candidate to represent the RFSA on the trust. So one of our directors is uh, um, is uh, the RFSA candidate, and uh, there are a total of six uh, members of the trust, uh, two RFS staff members, and four um, four volunteers. And um, since the formation of that trust. Uh, the, all four volunteers are in some way um, members of the RFSA, either State Board or State Council. And do you know um, if funds from that trust can be used to, um, or for the benefit of volunteers, RFS volunteers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, the potential aim of the trust. Um, and already some... 90 odd thousand, 90 million rather dollars have already been uh, set aside for um, volunteer initiatives. And the terms of the trust only apply though to RFS firefighters and not firefighters from interstate, is that right? That's correct, yes, and, and, and that, um, that was pointed out in the um, the uh, original fundraising by uh, Miss Barber as well. So, Commissioners, you may be aware of the recent decision of the New South Wales Supreme Court in the matter of the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and Brigades Donation Fund on the application of McDonald and others. The citation is 2020 NSWSC 604. Background to the case is set out in paragraphs three to six, and the judicial advice provided by Justice Slattery appears at paragraph 83. Uh, gentlemen, I'd now like to ask you some questions about volunteering and volunteerism. Uh, Mr. Wood, because you represent the council, I'll ask, and both the South Australian. Association, I'll ask you to answer this from two perspectives, please, uh, and just indicate in your answer when you're answering for the Australian body and the South Australian body. Can you just describe the trends in your experience in relation to volunteer firefighters? Uh, when you say trends, um, could you expand on that just a little bit, please? I. Uh, are volunteer firefighter numbers increasing, decreasing? Oh, no, that, that, that's fine. Um, from the South Australian perspective, um, we are fairly static at the moment. Um, of course, after a big fire, there's always a, a, an influx of, of inquiries and new membership. A couple of years on from that, we find that those numbers tend to drop back to a fairly static level. Our volunteer workforce is slowly ageing, um, which is uh, obviously a concern for us. From the national perspective, um, I know that a, um, a copy of the um, of the national um, survey has been has been tendered to you. That indicates overall a fairly similar arrangement to uh, to South Australia, I, I believe. So that is that volunteer numbers are static, but they are ageing. I believe so. Thank you. Um, Mr McDonough, what's the experience of the RFSA in relation to volunteer numbers and age? Um, uh, the, uh, this past season has seen a doubling of the number of new members uh, applying to join the um, Rural Fire Service. Uh, typically, uh, an average year is around about 4,000 new members. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've had over 8,000 uh, application, new applications. And so um, this last season obviously has had uh, quite a, generated quite a significant interest. Um, and the other trend that we've noted is that typically in a normal year when we have the 4,000 new applications, um, there is a, a lag between joining and providing the appropriate training to get the vo new volunteers on the ground. Um, and, and typically you have a few people drop out because it's taken too long to get them involved. Um, in this last season, um, right across the state, we've seen a significant um, reduction in the number of people that have dropped out after applying. 
So uh, quite an encouraging sign, certainly from, from my point of view, that uh, we've got quite a few members, um, new members who are still keen to, to become involved, even though they're in, in many cases some have waited up to 12 months to get their training. What's the typical lag? Is the, oh, I probably should ask, is there a typical amount of time that represents the lag between the application and when the training is able to be done? Uh, look, it, and, and in the rural, New South Wales Rural Fire Service, certainly some changes have uh, been implemented in the recent years. We've now got online training for basic firefighting, which is the initial training course that uh, volunteers are required to do. Um, that's now offered online, so a lot of lot of members uh, are able to take advantage of that and do the training as, as soon as their memberships confirm. Um, but as you would appreciate, there's still quite a large number of people who uh, struggle with the online uh, learning and and would prefer a classroom uh, approach. So we did look. It, it varies right across the state. Uh, it's a matter of when the courses are scheduled and when these people can uh, make the time available to attend the course. I imagine as volunteers, a lot depends on the volunteers' preparedness or availability to undertake the training as much as it does when the courses are offered. Absolutely, and, and, and nearly always there's a conflict uh, with uh, somebody who's working on a weekend or the We've run it during the week and they're not available. So, yeah, there's, there's always these issues, particularly with volunteers, because uh, they attend when they can. Um, I, I'm not sure, and apologies if you answered this, um, what's the age demographic, what's the trend like in relation to the age of the RFSA um, members? Yeah, I uh, checked with that uh, recently uh, with the Rural Fire Service and, and the figures I've given at the um, age is uh, average age or median age is around 52 for males and around uh, 51 for females. And, and that's, uh, when you think about the people that have got time to volunteer, it's those of us uh, that are in the twilights of our career who have a little more time, less children, less uh, involvement in community activities or not less children, but children have grown up and moved out, less reliability, or children relying on their parents other than financially. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, we tend to have a little bit more time to spare and, and, and give back to the community. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. You've uh, elicited some um, <laughs> chuckles in this room. <laughs> with suggestions that people uh, in the latter half of their life have more time on their hands than others. Um, uh, Mr Barnett, can I turn to you now and ask, uh, uh, can you just describe trends you've observed in Victoria in relation to Victorian volunteer firefighters? Look, very similar to the others in that you get peaks and troughs. So if you have a busy fire season and certainly a fire season that elicits um, a large amount of media um, reporting and activity. Um, after each summer, we, we do get an influx of new members. Um, from an historical point of view, the trend is certainly a downward trend. Um, it's, it, it, look, it was a slight trend down, and I can give you some references of points. So if I look at the year um, of 1998, and I'll come back to why that's probably a significant year from a CFA perspective. But um, the total number of volunteers was 65,992. So you can, you can obviously see that between um, those intervening years and now, we're now with 53,311. So that, that is a large drop. Unfortunately, we have experienced a significant, um, I guess, downward trend in the last five years and uh, looking at the figures, we've probably lost roughly around the same amount of volunteers in the last five years as we had in the 15 years prior to that. So it's 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 certainly a worrying trend in the short term. Um, I, I'll talk to you about age in a minute, Mr Barnett, but you raise an interesting um, point. I'll ask this of you first, but then get Mr Wood and Mr McDonough your perspectives as well. If volunteer numbers remain on that decline or at least static, as 
your evidence um, seems to suggest. Will there be enough volunteer firefighters to deal with the type of fire season we saw over 2019-2020? So look, the, the short answer is uh, yes, but it's about understanding why the numbers are dropping. Now, if the numbers were dropping because people weren't interested and weren't available, then that goes to the heart of your question of whether we can be prepared or not. The evidence in our observation doesn't support that theory. Australians still have a very high volunteering rate compared to other parts of the world. So we've still got a healthy culture in Australia for volunteering and the healthy recruiting numbers, um, I think, lend themselves to say people want to volunteer. But when you start looking into the reasons why volunteers are leaving, and certainly those reasons from an association point of view, it's the dissatisfaction about how they are treated. It's dissatisfaction about how they are respected and recognised. And certainly from our perspective, that's what we believe is driving the, the downturn. So our belief very strongly is if you actually start addressing some of the reasons why volunteers are choosing um, to divert their energies elsewhere in their communities, that actually has a very high prospect of arresting the decline. Thank you for that. I'll just turn to Mr Wood now. Do you have any comment to make on that question of whether if numbers, at least from your state's perspective, remain static, will there be sufficient numbers of volunteer firefighters in the future to um, respond to a fire season like we saw last season? Yeah, look, um, Mr um, Adams' um, response was, um, was, was very, very good there and it's difficult to add much to it. Again, from the South Australian perspective, I think um, in South Australia we're OK um, regarding numbers. But let me put it to you this way. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Australia in general, and South Australia, uh, of course, needs a really vibrant, slowly expanding volunteer um, emergency sector. Um, I mean, the country's population is still growing. The 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 um, the, uh, the township and urban areas are, are, are expanding, and we need you know we need that slowly expanding um, service to provide those um, fire services to it. The generosity that volunteer firefighters provide to, to their states is enormous. I, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but, but our organisation, uh, the, the Country Fire Service, um, offered up a figure of approximately $100 million in volunteer labour value over the last 12 months. I don't know what hourly rate they worked it out on. Um, but $100 million from 13,500 volunteer firefighters is a huge amount. Uh, I don't think sometimes governments understand the, the, the amount of value that we provide um, to the state. Um, and, uh, Mr Wood... So it's I, about respect. Uh, apologies, I didn't mean on. to cut you off. I, I, I guess I have jumped into the issue of volunteers and volunteer numbers and trends, but perhaps you could explain for the assistance of the Commission what do volunteer firefighters or a volunteer firefighting capability provide to a jurisdiction's response to bushfires? Look, if I understand the, the, the question, um, in a large or in 90% of South Australia, we are the only response to those, to those emergency situations. There is no there is no paid service in 90% of South Australia. We are it. We are the response. Thank you, um, Mr. McDonough. I'm conscious I haven't asked you the question. If your numbers remain static, uh, which was the effect of your evidence earlier, will there be enough volunteer firefighters in the future to deal with a season like we saw last season? Look, I believe there will. Um, we, um, we 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 need to certainly make some improvements, and, and, and those are underway already within the New South Wales. Um, one of the uh, complaints that uh, you may have had, and certainly we've had, is that some some members, and certainly not the majority, but some members would complain that they were willing and able to volunteer, but um, weren't called on at a particular time. 
uh, I suspect uh, they eventually did get called on to, to do something, but um, uh, we've, we've had to Im have to improve our systems and uh, um, information gathering so that we can work out that these people are available and call on them when, when they're able and willing to, to assist. So look, I, I don't have any fear for the numbers. Um, uh, it's more the the um, demands of the uh, inquiries such as this that will potentially create uh, generate work uh, outside of uh, normal firefighting that uh, concern me. And Mr. Barnett, um, I'm conscious you hadn't completed your answer to trends while uh, before I took us off on a tangent. Um, did you just want to give us some information about what the demographics are of volunteer firefighters in Victoria? I could. Could I go back to your tangent though? Because I actually think it was a critical <laughs> point and I wanted to add to Mr Wood's answer if I may. Of course. Thank you. Um, it's around the value of volunteers and, and Mr Wood pointed out that for many parts of Australia, and it's not just in South Australia, but they are the only um, response. But I want to make the point that it's, it's actually a deliberate strategy, not for it to be the only response, but the other value that volunteers provide the communities and certainly from a resilience point of view. We approach um, fire service delivery as a shared responsibility between the general public and the fire service. So instead of just picking up a phone and calling for help, it's actually about partnering with our communities and actually building um, that capability and response to fires. Now, no matter, we cannot have a fire truck on every street protecting every house. Um, to give you a bit of an idea, you look at the population of Victoria and we have around two and a half thousand fire trucks. Now that, that sounds like a lot of fire trucks, but when you add up how many houses there are, you can't have a fire truck in, in every street. The part of the actual design of the volunteer service and systems is really that partnership with the community. And that's what actually builds the resilience of the community so that when disaster strikes, and it's not just fire, the same people that put their hand up for a volunteer firefighter role tend to be the same people that are also contributing in other community organisations. And part of the evidence that you will hear from most firefighters is the importance of local knowledge. And local knowledge is drawn from local community members actually participating in the delivery of their fire service. And you can't get any better and any closer to the community by actually involving the community, building that capability and giving them the skills to actually embed those systems and processes in communities so that when disaster does strike, you've got a really well prepared community that, that isn't reliant on others coming in. And certainly there will be times with the scale of disasters where they need assistance, but you've got an initial strike capability there placed on the ground. Um, so sorry, I've gone down your, your divergent. You asked me about uh, the demographics. Look, very, very similar themes um, as, as certainly Mr. Mr. Wood and Mr. McDonough. Um, I guess I always make the point there, there, look, there's a lot of narrative around an ageing volunteer workforce. Now people use that as a criticism I guess of emergency management volunteering and I've got to say they use it as a criticism of volunteering in general. Again I'd go back to the point that our services reflect the communities that they come from and Australia has an ageing population. So it's unremarkable, therefore, that the fire services would also have an ageing population. I make the other distinction that as, and I, I think Mr McDonough demonstrated it perfectly, in that as, as your lifestyle changes as you get older, your availability, so when you're young, um, you're, you're gaining knowledge, you're wanting to gain experience, you're building a career, you're building a family and certainly in your middle years you're, you're cementing your career and that's really children and, and those kind of commitments. And then as you start getting older you, you start having different availability. So again I would say it's actually a strength of our system that when people have the most time available to them is why they are most attracted in signing up, volunteering and giving back to their communities. But the part that often gets missed, so I'll, I'll be perfectly frank, so 24% of CFA volunteers are over the age of 65. But the thing that people miss is 36% are aged between 16 and 44. 
And when you add that number up, I mean, we're talking about 18 and a, 18 and a half thousand CFA volunteers in that age group. Um, if you look at the numbers that get used each fire season, um, it's approximately, so from a Victorian perspective, um, it's alleged that it's, it's roughly around 20,000 get used operationally each year. Um, and that shows that not everyone's available all the time. But that's why the trends and people keep focusing on, I guess, the, the age demographic without looking, well, actually, there's plenty of opportunity in other areas as well. It's about how do we tap in to those different demographics? Um, now, the last part of my answer, I referred to the decline and why 1998 was a significant point for CFA, and that was the, the timing of the Linton uh, fires in Victoria, where we, we lost five volunteer firefighters. That was the start of the introduction of minimum skills training. And I make that point because a lot of the focus of the Commission will be around I guess, training and portability of skills. And I'd like to make the point that one of the big drivers of the numbers, certainly from a Victorian perspective, is as the requirements have increased, so has the time commitment required of volunteers. And these are all pressures that are building on people's availability and ability to actually volunteer to their fire service. So you, you, you can't separate the two. I've got some questions for you about training uh, a little later, but when you're talking about requirements, Mr Barnett, are you referring to the training requirements? Yeah, so, so minimum skills, um, it's a horrible way of referring to it, so we're actually changing how we refer to it, which will be the general firefighter package. But it's it's really mandatory, um, the base, base level skills that are required for a volunteer to hold before they are allowed on the fire ground to be mentored and complete their, their training over the years. So that is certainly, or it seems to me at least, to be a... Um, barrier to increasing numbers. Um, Mr Wood, can I go back to you and ask you, um, in your experience, or are you aware of any other challenges to increasing the numbers of volunteer firefighters? One of the... <sighs> Yeah, the, the short answer is, is, is yes. Uh, training is a training is a significant part of it, of course. Um, one of the others is is, and it, look, and it's, I'm sorry, it's related to training. Um, it's it's about the soft skills training. It's about the development of volunteer leaders to being able to work well with other people and encourage and and bring along. Um, and in that sense, encourage other people from the community to come and join. Um, that didn't explain it very well, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I... Uh. Sorry, we'll just jump in there. Mr Wood, you explained it perfectly, so please don't cut yourself short. <laughs> I think you gave us exactly the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the sense of what one of the issues are. So, no, please don't cut yourself off like that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Mr McDonough, do you have any experience of any challenges to increasing the number of volunteer firefighters in New South Wales? Uh, look, I don't uh, necessarily have any experience of, of the, the challenges. I mean, I, I think uh, Andy certainly did uh, touch on a point where um, the soft skills um, quite often you will get a group of people running a fire brigade in a country town and uh, the rest of the community um, for some reason uh, find it difficult to uh, become involved with those individuals. So that's one of the challenges that we face, I suspect, all across the country and not only in firefighting but in many other uh, not-for-profit organisations. Thank you, Mr McDonough. That's a, an interesting insight. Um, I now want to ask a slightly different question um, and I'll start um, again with you Mr Wood uh, Mr Barnett I, I just before I do Mr Barnett I'm conscious you I think answered the point in relation to training so I won't go to you uh, specifically but Mr Wood um, have you um, observed any barriers or um, 
no, barriers to improving volunteer retention. So when you have a volunteer firefighter, how do, how do you get them to stay volunteer firefighters? What, what a very, very good question. Um, this is something that, that varies enormously around the country, of course. Um, just the diversity of, of the volunteer firefighter structures around the country um, make, make this a bit difficult. Because we are truly community-based organisations, um, the community has to be involved. Uh, has to be involved, and that's that's something that not everybody is is able to you know to do to engage their communities. Um, if volunteers are are not um, are not content or not happy in their position, they don't necessarily. Um, resign and move away, but they do pull back a little bit, and this is a this is a very difficult thing to um, to measure. So instead of um, instead of responding as they as they normally would if they're disenchanted, they might pull back and say, "Well, tonight I'm going to have dinner with the family instead of respond." That that is a um, it's not necessarily a, a reduction in the numbers. But it's a reduction in the capability of the service. Does that does that make sense? Yes. Um, yes, it does. Uh, it must be extremely difficult to measure. It, it, oh, look, I think it's impossible to measure, but it's something that needs to be understood. And this is one of the reasons why uh, I'm trying to avoid saying that volunteers are fragile. That's that, that's not the case. It's why we need to have volunteers respected properly so that they don't become disenchanted with the system and pull back their service just a little bit. Mr Wood, is, is, Mr. Wood is, I think you're trying to say that they're human. Absolutely. Yeah. Of, of course. We all get disenchanted with things and we are less likely to, to give that extra bit if we're disenchanted with the system. That's, that's what I find within the brigade and within people I talk to in the state here. Thank you, Mr Wood. Uh, Mr. McDonough, turning to you now, um, uh, have you had any experience of barriers to improving volunteer retention in New South Wales? Uh, again, uh, not particularly in uh, retention, uh, other than the issues that uh, have uh, Andy, both Andy and Adam have raised. Um, we ha we have to remember that. Volunteer firefighting probably brings the broadest cross-section of society of any organisation in, in the country. Um, everything from barristers uh, down to um, unemployed. Um, so it's it's that's the challenge that we all face. I think as volunteers, we have to we have to bring that very diverse group of people together and get them to work as a team. Uh, works reasonably well in, in probably 90% of the cases and the other 10% are, are challenges. Not unlike uh, probably many other organisations again, but uh, yeah, it's the, it's the diversity of, of backgrounds more than anything that I think creates the biggest challenge. And just staying with you for a minute, with that diversity of backgrounds, um, do you nevertheless find that um, people who wish to be volunteer firefighters or who are volunteer firefighters share a common commitment to their community, to their um, the people who live around them to make sure that um, the community response is as good as it can be? Uh, again, I, I go back to Andy's uh, comment. There are some who, who absolutely have that belief that uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a camaraderie that, that is generated amongst volunteer firefighters um, where, you know, we're there to get the job done and we want to get the job done quickly and go home is probably the, the, the bottom line there. But there is a camaraderie. But the, as you would expect, the levels of commitment from some individuals versus others are, are differ significantly. Thank you. Uh, Mr Barnett, I appreciate Mr Wood and Mr McDonough have probably answered the question, but do you have any additional insights to offer the Commission? 
Yeah, Mr Glover, one of the things I was most impressed about your opening statement this morning is you made the point around the professionalism of volunteers. And for, for us, this is, and I'm, I'm going to say two things that sound the opposite, but often when volunteers are recognised for the service that they provide, um, just because people don't quite understand how it all works, um, we get we get lovely statements and we, we deeply value and respect it when people, you know, they call us heroes and they, they uh, such hyperbole around the commitment. And don't get me wrong, that's incredibly important to know that we have the public behind us. But there's also a notion of just not understanding that for many people, this is this is their community that they are there to protect. And yes, they are absolutely brave. Yes, they are absolutely courageous. But the commitment and the professionalism of what they've given up to, to do it, to do it safely, and to do it professionally is often missed. And the general public think, well, a paid firefighter goes through a whole bunch of training and there's a recognition there that that's a profession. Yet when people look at volunteers, it's like, well, aren't they lovely people? Yes, they are lovely people. They're the most generous people I've, I've ever come across. But it's that respect for the professionalism that they bring the job and the professionalism of wanting to keep their community safe. So we go back to that common theme of, of lack of respect and recognition and, and, and going into a little bit more detail. We're a family and going back to, to Mr Wood's comments around um, the human nature, as, as the cost of fire services has got more and more, the involvement of government in the running of fire services and brigades in particular has increased and increased. Sadly, that brings with it a, a bureaucracy and regulation and requirements. And when you're talking about small community groups, they are like a family. They've banded together to come to the protection of their community. And all of a sudden, you've now got some larger players coming and saying, well, you need to do it this way and you need to make sure you fill out those forms. These are all things that start to weigh down on volunteers. Um, in our National Volunteer Welfare and Efficiency Survey, we asked the question around what the motivation is of volunteers. And I, I wanted to talk to the Victorian result um, in the survey because it shows you, what, we, we give people a choice to let us know what are, what's the main reason that they become a volunteer firefighter. Um, Mr Barnett, um, based on Mr Barnett, would yes. you like, we can bring up that page, if the page of the survey that you might be referring to, if that would assist you. That would be fantastic. It's far easier. A it, picture tells a thousand yes. words. Uh, I, I thought it might be. Um, uh, operator, can you please bring up nnd.001.01 235.01 underscore 0114. Thank you. <laughs> for That's making a miracle. Read the, the document ID. Uh, so, uh, Mr Barnett, I think this was uh, the page you were referring to. Please let me know if it isn't, but please do continue. Thanks, Mr Glover. So you can see that the number one reason, which is represented by the shield icon, is to help protect the community that they live in. But then the second most important reason was that sense of fulfilment in supporting their community in a meaningful way. Now, you can see the divergence of those two lines um, around 2016. And the reason that's significant, without, without wanting to go into too much detail, but the rising dissatisfaction of volunteers in Victoria had really the large decline started in 2016 and you can see that diversion and I think it's the point that Andy was was making in that they are so deeply driven for them to resign that's such a tragic they will avoid almost anything because they want to be there for their community but that divergence in they're no longer having much fun doing it I think is that explanation of why the lines start to diverge and they're, they're no longer getting the same sense of fulfilment in supporting their community. And for me, that's, that's one of the key things about when we look around barriers and what we can do to improve, it's addressing those items that are making them not feel that they're getting a sense of fulfilment from the time and commitment that they're making to, to their fire service. Thank you. Just staying with you for a moment, um, another uh, aspect of um, sort of the, this retention topic 
uh, that seems to come out in the Victorian survey. So I'll ask you first, but then I'll ask Mr Wood and Mr McDonough as well. Um, it says this... Um, there are no barriers to the roles that women can occupy within a brigade and diversity is accepted and welcomed at brigades. Can you just explain to us um, the significance of that or otherwise? Yeah, look, so, uh, look, I, I don't think anyone would be mistaken that firefighting has generationally been considered a male um, sort of dominated occupation. And that, that is an issue that I think all fire services in Australia are, are dealing with and to try and diversify and encourage um, women to, to become members of the fire service. So the, one of the questions, and there's a group of questions there, and what you'll find, the results are always very similar. The closer the decision-making process is to the local level, and that I mean brigade or group, the more satisfied volunteers are, and that underscores the importance of a little bit of self-determination um, of brigades. And that's that clash that I was talking to you about. Now, the obvious thing is, so a group of men don't think there's much barriers to women joining their brigade. Interestingly, though, when you drill down into it and you only extract, and I don't have the figures with me, but if you extract how women answer that question, it's still a very high result. So, and the fire services in particular have have made significant inroads into myth busting that you, you need to be six foot tall and you know um, a, a male to be a valued member of the fire services. It's you know nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wood, uh, Mr. Wood, and Mr. McDonough. I I saw you nodding along. Uh, while Mr Barnett was giving his answer there. Unfortunately, uh, the, your nods won't appear on the transcript. Uh, so I'll just uh, get you first, Mr Wood, just to um, uh, offer any insights you have in that respect. Yeah, yeah nodding in support of, uh, about, of uh, Mr Barnett's comments, um, uh, of course. Um, look, women in the fire service, um, are, the numbers are growing slowly. Um, a lot of it, I think, depends on the community attitudes. And I could I, I could say that I came across a brigade once that, that, that wouldn't allow women in the brigade at all. They said there was no place for that. That was 10 years ago. That brigade now has close to 20% women in it. A change of leadership, change of attitude. I'd like to not provide identities to that brigade. Oh, um, but I, I offer that as a, as, a, as a reflection of how attitudes are changing. It goes beyond women, though. Um, Non-traditional firefighter volunteers would, would be a better way of describing it and the encouragement for those people to become involved from the community is, I think, is increasing generally, and, and that's a very positive thing. And I think more efforts need to be applied to encouraging non-traditional firefighter volunteering. Thank you. Uh, Mr McDonough, uh, finally to you, um, I think I saw you nodding as well. Did you just want to give any insights or any additional thoughts you have on the issue of participation by women and um, diversity in brigades? Uh, it, absolutely. Uh, and, and look, uh, I can do nothing but agree with my colleagues there that uh, we, we certainly um, need to encourage more women to, to think about or realise that they are quite capable and, and uh, in fact, uh, in my experience, make better leaders than some of my male colleagues. Um, but uh, it's, it's something that we, we need to do and, and certainly in New South Wales we've recognised that uh, in, in many cases, certainly in the remote farming communities, that the people that have the time are the, are the, 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 the mothers of children who's off, off at school and, and can jump on a truck and get out there fairly quickly while um, the men get their lives organised and, uh, uh, and get out to, uh, to assist. So, yeah, it's, it's certainly something, and we, and we need to do more, I think, to encourage uh, women to, to participate. Thank you, Mr McDonough. Um, I had one final topic uh, one final series of questions in relation to volunteerism and uh, volunteering, and that relates to 
the potential role of the Australian government in encouraging, maintaining and strengthening volunteer arrangements. Uh, Mr Wood, can I ask that question of you first, please? Perhaps from your perspective as the CAVFA representative. Yes, yes that, that, that's fine. Um, one, of the, one of the issues, um, and I know my colleagues will pick up on some others, but one of the issues is, is protections um, for volunteers uh, around the country. Um, can you just describe... Around the states... Sorry, can you just describe what yep. you mean by protections, please? Protections in relation to right. what? One of the examples I could use there would be uh, presumptive legislation, presumptive cancer legislation uh, around, the, around the country. That it, it, it's... Um, it means that um, that if a firefighter uh, uh, contracts a number of um, or any one of a number of particular cancers, it is automatically assumed that that is because of the firefighting duties. Uh, in, in short, the situation around the country is that from state to state, that av that varies enormously as to what um, um, coverage is provided to volunteers. And I wonder whether the the federal government could have some some influence there in getting some standardisation of that sort of protection. Uh, another example would be um, return to work workers' compensation. If we're um, if we're injured on the fire ground, the arrangements from state to state there vary vary a great deal, um, and some uniformity would um, would would be beneficial. I would uh, I would imagine. And uh, Mr. Wood, just before. I leave you on this aspect of the questioning. I should mention uh, my understanding is CAVFA is an affiliate member of AFAC. Can you just describe for us what that affiliate membership of AFAC gives your organisation? <laughs> yeah, yes, that, uh, that membership gives us the, um, the connection with AFAC, I think, is the way to describe it. AFAC being made up of all the fire agencies uh, around the country, it gives us yeah, it gives us the connection. It it, it it enables us to have input directly into into policy making uh, and associated things at uh, at AFAC. And that's a, that's um, a non voting membership. I believe it's a non voting membership. It's an affiliate membership. Does that mean you're not in the it room? It does. Does that mean you're not in the room where it happens? Correct. Thank you. And I'm it sorry, does. I didn't mean to cut you off. Please continue. Um, the, um, the, the connection is getting a bit dodgy at the moment. Um, it allows us uh, access to quite a few of the committees and working groups. They have representation that, that CAVA provides those committees and working groups. And that's the, the, the mechanism that we provide input. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. McDonough, turning to you then, um, do you see a potential role of the Australian government in encouraging, maintaining, and strengthening volunteer arrangements? Uh, certainly, um, one of the one of the big issues and one of the matters that gets raised uh, with us uh, regularly by our members is the um, the lack of uh, provisions within the taxation. Uh, Act to for members um, to defray at least part of their costs uh, in relation to taxation, uh, their cost of volunteering. Um, as you would appreciate, uh, um, some members have a lot of travel um, associated with being be participating as a volunteer to just to get to the fire station. Uh, you might have a 50 or 60 kilometre trip in the, some of the outer parts of the state. Um, and a round trip of 100 kilometres. Um, a lot of volunteers like to uh, buy extra equipment that the uh, services aren't able to uh, provide. Um, there is no incentive or no in, no benefit uh, from a taxation point of view. Can't kind of claim it as a tax mm -hmm. deduction. Mm -hmm. That's because and it's it would not be great to see. Oh yeah, sorry, Mr. Sorry? Donald, is that that's because that equipment's not used to produce accessible income, isn't it? Uh, look, I, I don't know the technicalities, but I do know that the, uh, the costs associated with the volunteering are not covered under the, the Tax Act, yes. Yeah, thank you. And, and sorry, please continue. Are there any other uh, 
um, is the Commonwealth. Yes, Commonwealth. in fact, there's there's one that you made reference to uh, in your uh, opening, and that is the um, the mobile phone network, the emergency um, network. Um, that is that is something that is vital, and my understanding is that we're still waiting on the federal government to allocate the um, bandwidth for for that network. And certainly in New South Wales, we're geared up to um, put that on uh, our radio network when when as soon as it becomes available. And that's becoming more and more critical as we begin be, rely heavily on. Um, technology for mapping and, and data transfer amongst the mobile units and uh, yeah, so that's something that, that certainly we could uh, we could move along fairly quickly. Thank you Mr McDonough. Uh, finally to you Mr Barnett, uh, could the Australian government uh, play a potential role in encouraging, maintaining and strengthening volunteer arrangements? Uh, most, most certainly, um, and I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of the points that, that have been made. And that, so, the volunteer protection. So, New South Wales, for example, their commissioner is able to issue a volunteer protection order, which which operates very similar to the Australian Defence Force protections to their reservist members. Um, volunteer firefighters don't get those protections in Victoria. Can, can I? So just, there's no sorry, legal... sorry, Mr. Barnett. Can I just stop you there? Does my understanding of um, uh, Commonwealth legislation relating to the Defence Force is that if you are an employee and you're performing service as a member of the ADF, your civilian employment is protected while you're carrying out that defence service. Is that what you're referring to? Correct. And you're also protected from discrimination, um, so adverse impact from your work as an emergency service volunteer um, in the form of a Defence Force reservist. Oh, thank you. And sorry, so can't, please continue. So, so they can't suffer demotion or they can't suffer any penalty because they have been sent away on deployment. And so does... Uh, so New South Wales has that uh, legislation or those arrangements, uh, but other states and territories do not. Is that right? So, look, I, I can only speak from a Victorian perspective, and we certainly don't have it in Victoria. Um, secondly, the New South Wales arrangement, as best I understand it, um, the commissioner has the power to declare it, but he must declare um, it to only... He, he covers a geographic area um, and to do with a particular fire, is my understanding. So it's not a across-the-board thing. It's a very specific for a fire or a campaign and for a geographic area. Perhaps Mr McDonough could speak better to that. Mr McDonough, are you able to explain how those arrangements work in New South Wales, please? Uh, yeah, my, look, my understanding is, is that is if a uh, state of emergency, Section 44, has been declared for that area, and typically they are declared for local government areas. And so if it is, uh, Section 44 has been declared, then those uh, uh, um, rules come into place. But only, only for those individuals that are, are within that area. Yes. Um, so, Mr Barnett, going back to you, so that seems to be one aspect, the employment protections, for, for want of a better description. Are there any other roles the Australian government could play? So the inverse of that is, I guess, the support for um, employers and most certainly the self-employed. And this is, again, it goes back to that shared responsibility um, with our communities. Um, they, our employers, um, and certainly the self-employed, are often the unsung heroes of, of fire campaigns. They are making just as much sacrifice sometimes in releasing their employees, um, or in the case of self-employed, um, and certainly farmers um, and primary producers. They're actually making incredible sacrifices um, in order to leave their business and deploy to the front line. So anything that can support, and and this is, and I know you may come to it, but around compensation for volunteers, and it's a very fine line, but this is around token recognition to, again, share the responsibility. So it's not to fully recover. I mean, Andy spoke very well about making sure there's no out-of-pocket expenses. And uh, look, one of the biggest problems all our agencies experience 
is, I guess, a lack of resource and funding um, and takes me to my point around some other protections for volunteers. So occupational health and safety, from a Victorian perspective, we don't enjoy the same protections under the law as employees do, so we, we've got no right um, to, to some of those protections and organised work groups. And, and while we're facilitated with some of that, there, there's no legal protections. And I've spoken a lot about, I guess, dissatisfaction with volunteers. And one of the core questions becomes that when volunteers are in dispute um, with their agency or, or with their, their government, state or federal, um, what avenues do they have to actually help them um, go into those discussions? And sadly, we often find ourselves completely alone in that journey. So the Commonwealth certainly um, it may be able to assist um, providing some, some checks and balances, some accountability around that, and a place for us to go if we need help um, and, and support. Uh, the other one was around, and I've spoken about the Army Reserve model, but that was also around the, the recognition, and I guess, look, the Army do it really, really well, and this is around a centre of excellence type thing. And I spoke earlier about self-determination, how important that is to motivate volunteers. Um, in Mr Wood's answer around AFAC, the, the crux of that is we're not often at the table or involved in part of the decision-making process. And when I speak about a centre of excellence, it's around a body that volunteers themselves can actually have some self-determination over and help lead their own research, their own incentives, their own kind of projects of what they think would address some of the barriers. And instead of it them being tacked on to somebody else's group, actually giving them the ability to be empowered to, to lead some of those conversations, which would do absolute wonders um, for, for morale. And the last one for me was, was around DGR status, certainly from a Commonwealth perspective. The way that the, the laws were written, only the agencies delivering the actual service are entitled to deductible gift recipient status um, as the agency. So as associations, all the work that we do in our advocacy role and in our support role, we're not entitled to DGR status. We each run, um, well, most of us run welfare type funds. Those funds are covered under necessitous circumstances, but um, it doesn't cover us for the really incredibly important work that we do in, in leadership development, advocacy and, and education. Uh, thank you very much for those comprehensive uh, answers, all three of you. Um, Mr Barnett, because you mentioned the issue of compensation, I should just ask the three of you this from the perspectives of your organisations. And uh, Mr Wood, uh, just because you've been starting, I might ask you this question from your perspective as the representative of the South Australian Association. Is it... Um, uh, or, uh, sorry, I'll start that again. Do your members, do your volunteer firefighters want to be paid when they're performing firefighting services? Um, we have uh, put this question to them many times um, and it has been the same response every time over the last uh, 14 years that I've been involved is no, they do not want to be paid. Thank you. Uh, Mr. They, they do it. Oh, no, sorry, please continue, Mr Wood. No, um, uh, they do it to uh, to support their communities or for the other reasons, you know, previously stated uh, today. Um, it's not about the money. Thank you, Mr Wood. Mr McDonough, is that the view of your members as well, your volunteer members? Uh, look, I, I think it would be fair to say that's the view of the majority of members. I'm sure there will be some out there that would, would love to be paid for their volunteering. Uh, but certainly the majority of members, and I, and I think uh, whenever it's discussed, certainly around our uh, state council, um, uh, comments such as, as soon as they start paying, I'm out, I'm leaving. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely no payment. Thank you, Mr McDonough. Um, Mr Barnett, is that also the situation in, with the members of your association? It is. And we're, look, we've made the point about how diverse and large our memberships are. And certainly each time that we've asked this question and sought feedback from volunteers, the overwhelming majority is very uncomfortable around payment for their volunteering service. 
But the principle that comes up, and it's, there's always a but to that, and that is, we've touched on it before, making sure that they're not out of pocket as a result of their volunteering. And as the requirements uh, are increasing, not only from a training perspective, but also fundamental equipment. I mean, when we talk about small tools like, like torches and masks and things like that, volunteers having to put their hand in their own pockets to fund some of those things because the agency is unable to provide um, personal issue of those things. Being able to restore people so that they're not out of pocket is most certainly comes through loud and clear. But the one that, that has come up recently is around a safety net for people. Um, I think everyone volunteers, and for me, this is the overcommitment perspective. We don't do enough to monitor um, volunteers overcommitting themselves. And I, I spoke earlier that the thing that drives volunteers is to protect their communities. In, in times of disaster and emergency, there is nothing we won't do for our communities. And that's the time when our decision-making process around our incomes and our family obligations and everything else, we're probably going to be the worst judges of that kind of thing. And that's where I see a role for a safety net to provide a little bit of protection um, to protect us from ourselves sometimes. And instead of just continuing to wanting to do more and more and more, a safety net that tries to, A, we monitor those deployments. Um, the, if you ask a volunteer, why, and like, this came up this year, when, when the Commonwealth Payment Scheme came up, very few people came to me and spoke to me about, well, actually, we do want payment. When I unpacked that and discussed what was motivating that, it mostly came from people who had very long deployments. We're talking three, four, five weeks, and the impact that had either on their business or their employment. And when I asked the question of, okay, may I ask why you felt the need to be doing three or four week deployments when I received just as many complaints from volunteers who were not deployed this year and wanted to? And it came down to a real immaturity in the systems to identify how many and who, what volunteers are actually available for deployment and how we share that around, but also the lack of line of sight to volunteers who kept putting their hand up. And for many, because of, I guess, the immaturity in resourcing uh, when it comes to, to deployments, people feel they won't leave the fire line if they don't know the next relief crew is on its way and they can't see it. And because you, you touched on it, certainly in your opening remarks, around this two-way communication between incident control centres and the field, without that communication about what resources are coming and that there will be plenty of people to actually do what's required, volunteers are making judgment calls based on what they can see, smell and touch. And when you're on the fire line and you don't see anybody coming behind you, um, you have to be dragged kicking and screaming from that fire line because you are there to protect your community. Um, it's providing that kind of assurance. Mm, thank you. And just on that issue of overcommitment, um, does that issue also have sort of more general non-economic effects, so to speak? I'm particularly thinking about health and well-being effects. So PTSD is probably the really big question mark that we're, we're all struggling to understand the impacts around that. And, and certainly, and that's why I think our earlier remarks, most firefighters do not oppose training, and that's that preparation. Mr Wood spoke earlier about the soft skills, and I would put mental health and mental first aid most squarely in that category of how we prepare and build resilience of our people in dealing with that. But it is most certainly something that is starting to come up far more frequently, and that is how we can mentally support um, our people. Thank you, Mr Barnett. Um, Mr McDonough, I think I saw you nodding um, during that answer, did you have any insights you wanted to share? Uh, look, I, I couldn't agree with Mr. Barnett more. Uh, we, you know, the big issue that we have uh, certainly in New South Wales, and I suspect it's the same everywhere else, is um, people uh, not feeling they can leave because uh, things might get out of control, and um, it does have a long-term effect in many cases. Uh, and, and you know, our Organisations need to, or have to um, implement systems to, um, to to provide the information, I guess, that to incident control that you know that these people have been on the fire line for 12 hours. It's time they went home. And, and I know there were many cases during this last season. I, I know, know a couple of individuals in my area who 
He did 48-hour shifts, and that's just totally unacceptable. Um, uh, Mr Wood, I'll, I'll go back to you, please. Can you um, add any insights or are there any additional insights you'd like to share? Yeah, look, completely support the comments from my two colleagues there. Um, with this, it, 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 some of it comes back to the motivators that, um, that, that, that drive volunteers to do what they do. Um, I mean, the two, as has been talked about, there's two primary motivators there. The, Protect the community, which is a, which is a duty-driven motivator, and the the fulfilment side is the, is an ego-driven. Both very powerful things. Um, the duty-driven side of it, predominantly in the rural areas, is is much higher than than the 51% nationally. It's it's the main reason most of us go out there to do it. There is nobody else. We have to do it. It, it it's a little akin to a call to arms. When a when a when a bad thing is happening in the community, there is no choice but to go out and try and try and help with it, and that reflects on on Mr. Manet's comments about um, over over volunteering, if you like. It is impossible, really, to um, to leave a uh, an active fire ground um, without knowing who's going to come and take over from you, and, and and that's a and that's a great difficulty for for a lot of rural firefighters. Uh, especially in those times before help arrives from further afield, we might be out there for long periods of time because there is nobody else. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Helps. Yes, thank you um, all for your answers. I propose to move on to the topic of training now. Um, I'll just check with the commissioners. Are you content for me to move on? Thank you, Chair. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Wood, I'll I'll start with you. Um, just uh, want to know your thoughts in relation to uh, training, uh, specifically in relation to volunteer firefighting. We understand um, from the submissions that have been received um, to the Royal Commission's issues paper that there are or is a national standard for training, but there seems to be quite a lot of variability in its delivery. Um, have you had any experience of that or heard from your member associations about those issues? Uh, yes, is, is the short answer. Um, the, the Australian um, nationally recognised training structure or system, um, I understand is not um, has not been taken up by all the states. Um, there are some that still work on a um, on an agency-based or an organisation-based uh, based system. Within the nationally accredited training, we've talked about it earlier today, that there, there's difficulties with transferring those um, elements of, of the training to other, to other states. It's not so much that the, that the qualification is different, uh, because, I mean, it's not. It's about primarily the terminology used from agency to agency varies. We call things different names. We we, we, we have slightly you know different different versions of you know of the same thing from state to state. And ultimately, it seems to be easier to say to people, look, yes, we understand you've done the training and we accept that, but we'd still like you to do our. Uh, our own training so that you're up to speed with everything. And that seems to be where a lot of the discussion comes from uh, as regards the portability of that nationally accredited training system. So what's the approach? The other... Oh, sorry, please continue. And then I was going to ask you what the no. approach is in South Australia. Uh, look, the approach is in South Australia, and I think we're, we're probably quite advanced with the, with the nationally accredited uh, structure. Um, somebody coming from the state, they'll bring their, um, their their qualifications with them. We do have a uh, a system of, of, of RPL recognised um, prior learning that it can be mapped across. But ultimately, most of those people still do at least the basic training that we do in South Australia. How hard and is that's it? That's primarily to get. Them. How hard is it to get um, that? Sorry? How hard is it to get that? recognition of prior learning if if someone moved across to South Australia? Um, it's physically a lot of work for the person doing the, you know, doing the, 
the mapping across of the qualifications. It's a lot of physical work to map it across. Um, and it's still, it's still ultimately better if that person coming across does some basic training to understand the peculiar parts that each state has um, regarding terminology, et cetera, et cetera. And that's even different types of fire. So differences between forest fires on the one hand and grass fires on the other. No, on, oddly enough, the, the fire's the same. It, it doesn't matter too much. It's the, it's the terminology we use for, um, you know, just, just for naming some bits of fire apparatus. Um, the different protocols that we use on radios, the, the different um, um, command and control protocols. I mean, whilst they're basically the same, there's still small variations that people need to need to know. Short of a of a national um, complete national approach, I, I don't know how we get around that. And I'm not advocating for a complete, you know, national system. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. McDonough. Um, what's your perspective from a New South Wales point of view on the issue of training for volunteer firefighters? I think I think the most significant uh, change recently has been the uh, national accreditation um, for a uh, training and a requirement for a certificate for in training and assessment. Um, it makes it very difficult, uh, certainly amongst volunteer land, for people to assess uh, those people that they've taken through a, a basic firefighting course, and, and that's all it is. It's, it's you know general safety and, and and how to hold a hose and put it on the uh, on the hot stuff. Um, we 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 need then to have somebody with a certificate four and in training and assessment, and and those. Um, that requirement is is fairly onerous, uh, fairly onerous, and it's fair to say that uh, the, our association, as well as the rural fire service, have spent a small fortune providing the funding for these people to do these courses. And is that um, th are those courses delivered by both volunteer RFS and paid RFS members? Uh, in New South Wales, the vast majority of courses are delivered by volunteers. Okay. Uh, very few courses are, are delivered by uh, staff. Thank you. And and in order to deliver those courses, those volunteers need the certificate for cert for qualification in training. Uh, it certainly needs to be supervised by somebody with that. Um, not necessary to deliver, uh, deliver. but but to assess to, to assess the success, if you like the. To pass them, uh, you should have a certificate for. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Barnett. Um, what's the Victorian experience in relation to training for volunteer firefighters? So very similar. We use a the, the national system um, where we can, and I guess the qualifier there is um, of late. Um, sometimes it's been easier to have an internal qualification than, than I guess the the onerous part that comes with some of the national qualifications. Certainly, from a volunteer perspective, what comes through very loud and clear always is around portability of skills. People want to learn something once and then for it to be recognised not only by their employer, but by other um, organisations and agencies that they might want to volunteer with, and certainly if they move interstate. So the, the portability is a, a huge check. Um, it tends to be, and you spoke about the RPL process, and I've got to say my experience from talking to volunteers often is it's easier just to redo the course. And that's because it's, it's a very paperwork-centric process and the onus is put on the person who wants the RPL. So from a volunteer perspective, all the onus is put on them to prove and provide evidence um, of what they know. So greater use of challenge testing is what we've been pushing for in Victoria for a number of years now. And it comes down to a trust, and I'm going to play devil's advocate on this one because the lack of trust is often what is driving people to do things differently. But when you're in a life and death situation, you want to know that the crew member that's got your back um, has the same skills as you do and has the same, I guess, qualifications. So it's that trust and the agencies feel the same way. But we talk about the interagency thing, and instead of asking people to do an entire course again, 
the lack of bridging sort of courses would, would to me appear a pretty simple fix of just making sure that at a national level, if you've got a volunteer transferring from one state to the other, that there's a real short, simple bridging course that involves challenge testing and practical um, designed for how volunteers prefer to, to learn, and that is through hands-on experience. Would that also address the issue that we've seen come up in uh, some of the responses to the issues paper about the significance of local knowledge? Would a bridging course like that, or sorry, I should start that again, could a bridging course like that be structured in a way to deliver some of that local knowledge that volunteers um, say is important to firefighting? So absolutely. Uh, there's two things that I've been confused in that. So the bridging course is around probably the technical skills and getting alignment. As Andy, Mr Wood said, uh, there's certainly, we love our acronyms, we love talking about things. I mean, we refer to fire trucks as appliances. When you talk to the general public, they think you're talking about a toaster. Um, but I guess there's the bridging course on the technical skills. But at the local level, that local knowledge, that's a real, really around induction. Um, and that's around inducting that member to their local brigade and local community. So the two parallel, but are slightly different. Um, thank you. Um, uh, Mr Wood, is there anything you wish to um, add about the trying to capture local knowledge or the importance of local knowledge when firefighters transfer between states or even areas? Um, yes, look, in, in my experience, I, 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 I must admit I haven't found that to be much of a problem because at brigade level that, that, that knowledge is transferred fairly, fairly quickly. Um, to the to the new member, um, so I, I don't see that as a as a huge issue from from the South Australian perspective, or at least in my experience, I should say. Um, thank, thank you. Oh, please continue. Yeah, um, something I, I would like to talk about, if I can, and you may well have it as a question, is the soft skill issue and the soft skill training issue. Oh uh, yeah, please please do talk about that issue? How does that get incorporated into training or how does it get to be captured in training for volunteers? I, it, it's um, In South Australia, whilst there are some um, leadership type uh, training courses available, um, I, I suspect there is nowhere near enough to, to properly prepare our, um, our brigade level and group level people for working with, with, with people and managing people. We see, or I see the examples all around the state of, of some brigades that have a large turnover of volunteers and some that have virtually no turnover. A lot of that comes back to the, to the leadership and the way the brigade is managed and run. And that's a, that's a skill that needs to be, needs to be learnt generally. And I think there's a deficiency in the training system to provide those sort of skills. We talk about retention in, of volunteers. One of the reasons they, they leave is they're dissatisfied with their own brigade. That could be related to the, to the leadership or, the, or the, you know, the quality of the management of that brigade. So that's a fundamental thing that we could do to improve a whole range of issues from retention right to, to fire ground performance and, um, and satisfaction and all of those sort of things. In your experience, when a member leaves a brigade, um, is it the case that they will leave volunteer firefighting altogether or will they look to see if there's another brigade around? And I appreciate this won't work in really remote regions of the states, but is that something that's possible? Yeah, it, it's certainly possible. I mean, some 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 shift their um, their, their place of residence or work and, and, and need to to adjust because of that. If they're just dis if dissatisfied and do choose to leave the service uh, and not just pull back, um, then some of them go back to using a private um, a private you know farm appliance or uh, you know ute with a tank and pump on the back and provide the service to the community that way. Um, sadly. Yeah, and that when that happens, that takes them out of the the organised structure 
doesn't it? So they're they're more they're still volunteers and still contributing to the protection of the community, but without um, a coordinated role in the response effort. Is that right? To a very large extent, yes. Um, plus, also, and I think it's misunderstood sometimes that. Um, that all of our agencies are far more than just a fire response agency. We're, um, we respond to all sorts of incidents, uh, from, from hazardous materials to, to car crash to assist other agencies and all of these things. And when people leave the formal service and, and go on a farm fire unit, for want of a better word, they don't tend to participate in those other roles, uh, in those other responses. So we lose, we lose capability when, when that happens. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr McDonough, was there anything you wish to add in relation to the topic we've just been discussing? Uh, yeah, well, look, I, I think uh, probably, like, as my understanding at least, is to clarify the term local knowledge. Typically, the local knowledge refers to somebody that knows the geography of the local area, um, tracks where you might have a chance of pulling a fire up, where... Uh, houses or uh, assets are, uh, and, and really that's the, in most cases, in my experience, that's what people refer to as local knowledge. Um, thank you. Um, and just talking about that issue of local knowledge is probably a good segue into my last area of questions, which concern intrastate and interstate deployments of volunteers um, and the challenges to interoperability when you deploy volunteer firefighters interstate or when volunteer firefighters come into your state. Uh, Mr Barnett, because you sort of started that last question, can I start with you in the, the first instance? Are there? Are you aware of any challenges to interoperability when um, volunteer firefighters are deployed intrastate or interstate? So, uh, look, I, I think the difference is. So, yes, is is the short answer to that. I think, and I, I'd make the point that interoperability doesn't mean the same. It just means that systems are capable of of working together. And I guess the fear, uh, we've often spoken about the, the local community, the local level decision making. So the more we, we move to complete standardisation and mandatory anything, you start to take out some of the flexibility and agility that's required of the systems. And I'd, I'd make the argument that I'm sure there's great alignment between the, the Air Force, the Navy and the Army, yet it, it is seen that there are specific things that need to be different to suit their local protocols and, and what it is that they're concentrating on. And I'd say the same with fire. And to a certain degree, our, our fauna and fauna are very similar, but also quite different um, between states. So fire behaviour can be quite different, even though the principles are the same. But the interoperability, look, the equipment is probably the, the big one. Um, and again, I'd go back to, does every fire truck need to be identical? What I'd challenge you, you know, Layman's view would be, well, why aren't they all identical? I would make the point that we are building fire trucks in this state today that will be driven by people that aren't born yet. Um, because of the cost and under-resourcing um, of, the, of the sector, we've got our fire trucks can be there for 30, 33 years. Um, so even if you had standardisation with that kind of age profile of the fleet, um, you can't afford to replace every single truck at the same time. You know, we, we still have trucks without airbags because they were built when airbags didn't exist. Um, so I'd make the point around standardisation. A lot of focus sometimes is, well, why isn't everything the same? Well, it won't be. So what you do is you build into your training, um, I guess, that dynamic risk assessment, and also, which is a constant task of all firefighters. But it's about, and I think Mr Wood pointed to it earlier, have some fundamental principles where you may have some standardisation that then allow that interoperability. And again, I spoke about the bridging courses, but actually having documentation that when you get deployed to another state, radio customised for the state that you're coming from, here are the main differences that you're going to find. And I, I often use the example that this year we had crews operating in New South Wales. And in Victoria, when you are working around a hazardous tree, 
um, the letter K is spray paint on the tree to indicate that it's a killer tree. And our protocols in Victoria are around making sure that you have an exclusion zone around that tree um, and it's extremely dangerous. And our crews were, were trying to figure out why in New South Wales our colleagues were standing around pointing and looking up um, under K trees only to then discover that in New South Wales, K means there were koalas in the tree that need to be protected um, in case it got felled. So those very simple things, a bit, a bit of a cheat sheet about what's needed. Could I go back to, and it's, I'm going to do a little segue if I could, because it goes back to your earlier topic, but also demonstrates around this, this interoperability thing. One of the elephants in the room is around spontaneous and just-in-time volunteering. And one of the difficulties and challenges for emergency management volunteer organisations is because of the dangerous and the hazardous nature of what we do, you can't just pluck somebody and, and give them a task. You've, you've got to understand those protocols. So it's the support that you build in place to assist people with that um, in order to embrace some of these, I guess, upcoming opportunities and how we do that. And I think the improbability argument is probably a, a journey that will actually help us with some of that area. Yeah, thank you very much for that comprehensive um, answer. Uh, who would have thought K could stand for killer tree and koala in the same context? Uh, Mr. Wood, I'll go to you now, please. Um, do you have anything to Look, add? I, I, honestly, honestly, I'm not sure there's very much I can add to, uh, to Mr. Uh, but it's uh, comments there, um, other than to, uh, to say I, I fully support them. Um, I, I guess um, I, I personally don't go into state on, on deployment, so I, I, I can't speak, speak too well. It's my understanding that when South Australia sends a significant deployment in the state, they're sent with like a deployment manager and a whole heap of resources to allow them to, um, to operate effectively with with the uh, the group wherever they're going, um, that that's my understanding of the South Australian perspective, anyhow. Um, and is that designed so that that's almost that deployment manager fills almost a liaison role, so that 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 team's familiar with the local operating environment? Uh, correct. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr McDonough, um, did you have any comment you'd like to make on this topic? Uh, well, look, yes. Um, my experience, I operate uh, on the Queensland border in New, with New South Wales, and um, I think it's fair to say that we don't have too many challenges. Uh, fires are the same whichever side of the border it's on. Uh, the, the biggest challenge that, that I encountered last season was indeed the radio communication that um, various states have, have different terms for the same radio frequency and, and that certainly becomes a challenge uh, at least to start with until you can perhaps uh, sit there face to face and work out what the hell, what's going on. But um, generally, uh, in my experience, and, and I was more field control rather than firefighting, uh, once I briefed the strike team leader and um, arranged communication with them, uh, things things seemed to, seem to run fairly well, actually. And so um, we've heard evidence over a number of days from various witnesses about strike teams and um, the role you fulfil. Can you just explain to us, for the assistance of the Commission, what is a strike team and how is it used in firefighting? Uh, a strike team is a, a, is a group of firefighting vehicles, typically five in the order of around five vehicles, um, various configurations, uh, and a strike team leader who will usually um, be in a um, utility vehicle of some sort with uh, all the radio communications and, and typically when coming into state they will have radios that are compatible with the, the New South Wales network at least and, um, and, and really a fire ground controller only has to deal with that strike team leader, he doesn't need to get in touch with the trucks as long as the strike team leader is, is able to uh, communicate with his own troops, uh, you give them a task and they go off and do it. You, as I say, it, it worked reasonably well from my point of view. 
thank you. Um, when you're an incident controller, do you have more than one strike team under your command or just the one strike team? Uh, field controller, you have essentially, uh, certainly at the Long Gully Fire, I probably had about uh, uh, eight or nine strike teams. So, yeah, look, it depends on uh, the size of the fire and, and, and what resources you've been allocated from the uh, incident management team. Mm, thank you. Um, Mr Barnett, um, just before I ask you about the... I think I started with you in relation to interoperability, but does strike team have the same meaning in Victoria as it does in New South Wales? Yeah, I, I, I think it does anyway. Uh, so certainly it, it, it aligned with Mr McDonough's ex explanation of what a strike team was, so yes. Um, I, I guess my point would be um, you, you mentioned AIMS and the principles of AIMS in your opening remarks, and certainly that we're big supporters of that. The AIMS principle is really around span of control and trying to make sure that your direct reports, unless there's a really good reason, don't expand much higher than five. So that's why almost all our structures will look like little clusters. And so a strike team is five, a task force might be five strike teams. So we sort of build up, build up, build up. From an interoperability point of view, that's actually one of the resilient parts of our system, and that is compartmentalising I guess, the tasks and the crews, so that if you've got an interstate crew, you're actually able to segment them, compartmentalise them, put a liaison officer with them to act as that liaison, but you can then limit and control to a certain degree um, the tasks that they're assigned to try and match either their skills or background. So it actually adds a lot of resilience um, to the system. Thank you. I'm and just... redundancy, I would add, yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Um... Uh, Mr. Wood, just does is strike team in South Australia have the same meaning? Yes, completely the same meaning, um, and this is actually the beauty of the of the aims um, of the aims structure, um, and that um, I, I guess to a large extent it's uh, it's AFAC that keeps this system working through all the agencies, so that they're all on the same the same page and using the same terminology so that we can do this. Um, the aim structure um, with that span of control of approximately five to one is a, you know, is a great system to use and it's so adaptable to, to really dynamic situations, which, which is what we deal with all the time. Hmm. Uh, gentlemen, I could continue talking to you for hours, but I am conscious of the time. Uh, so that concludes my questioning. I will ask the commissioners if they have any questions. Just, just a couple of questions. I'll go to Commissioner Bennett first, if she has. Yes, I've just got a... Thank you. I've just got a couple of uh, quite short questions, hopefully. Um, first, um, just a very quick observation, and that is uh, talking about the... Um, attraction of women into the volunteers and also the numbers. I do point out that uh, women represent 50% at least of your available uh, volunteers, so um, good luck with increasing those numbers, which will then help arrest the decline. Um, but I have two questions. Mr Wood, at the very beginning, you said that you estimated the number of volunteers at about 250,000, I think was the figure. Um, can you give me an idea and perhaps um, what 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 are the total numbers of paid firefighters? Just so I can get a comparison between the number of volunteers and the number of paid firefighters. Do you know? All right. Uh, look, I can only provide that okay. information in regards to South Australia. Uh, in South Australia, we have approximately thirteen and a half thousand volunteers and approximately one thousand um, paid firefighters. Thank you very much, Mr. McDonough. What's the situation in New South Wales? Uh, my understanding is. Is uh, about uh, three and a half thousand paid, and three and a half thousand. Well, basically seven thousand, three and a half thousand retained. So seven thousand uh, effectively in the fire plus rescue organisation. Thank you, Mr. Barnett. Uh, so, look, I, from my own agency, um, we had approximately two and a half thousand uh, career staff within CFA, but we've we've got two services operating across Victoria. So, I'd be speculating, but I would say if you just doubled it, we're talking around five thousand. But in terms of the total number of volunteers in the state, so the fifty-three thousand exactly. So, so that's what I was really after: the number of volunteers compared to the number of um, non-volunteers, if I can call it that. Thank you. Um, Mr McDonald, does that change your your figures? 
Uh, well, no, no, it doesn't. Uh, I, I did uh, forget to or omitted the um, state forest and national parks, and I'm not sure of those numbers, but I would estimate they'd be probably about another thousand. Okay. Uh, and then the volunteers, um, we have seventy odd, uh, seventy odd thousand volunteers. Um, registered with the Royal Fire Service, okay. and uh, my guess is probably thirty between thirty and forty thousand of those are firefighters. Thank you very much. I have one other question, um, and I, I, it brings together two concepts in a way. That we, there was a reference to um, uh, the mental health of volunteers and, and matters such as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and also the question of um, volunteers not being out of pocket. Um, what I just wanted to know was if a volunteer needs to get medical help um, for um, uh, or, or, or assistance um, with regard to either mental health issues or indeed an injury issue, is that is that all covered, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barnett? So in Victoria, um, CFA operates its its own. It's an in-house system, so they self-insure to a degree um, a volunteer compensation scheme, which is designed precisely to cover um, all out-of-pocket expenses for any injury, uh, including mental health injury. In Victoria, the government has, and it's one of the very good initiatives of, of recent, um, is running a pilot program, which is a they call it the provisional payment scheme, which brings it in under work cover and work safe and actually provides a, a period of time where all medical out-of-pocket expenses will be covered while their compensation claim is, is being assessed. So, Thank you very much. Mr McDonough? Uh, yeah, look, in, in New South Wales, volunteers are treated as employees. So we have a full workers' compensation scheme. In fact, uh, I'd suggest that it's probably a better one than the uh, employed uh, people in uh, the rural fire service. And um, with respect to, it also treats um, mental health. And then uh, the other thing I might add is that uh, our organisation, the association, has um, is in the process of putting between six and 700 people through a mental health first aid training course, um, particularly in light of what's happened this season. Thank you very much, Mr Wood. Uh, very similar to, uh, to New South Wales, we are considered to be employees. And uh, and come under the uh, the state's workers' compensation arrangements, like like all other employees. Where it becomes a little bit cloudy, I guess, is is when self-employed and um, and retired or, un or unemployed people are involved. Uh, the medical expenses are still covered, um, but there is a there, there's some variations in there. Overall, we're looked after pretty well. Thank you very much. That's very helpful, and I'd like to just uh, thank you all very much for your evidence this morning. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I just have uh, one question. Building on the the topic we just talked about, about strike teams and your structures and, uh, and five into five into five uh, and, and the like, and one of the, the things that has come up quite often in public submissions uh, and, uh, and talking to people is the delegation of authority to make decisions. And, in fact, I think one firefighter made a comment to us that when we're talking about that, I think it was a backburn, timeliness of being able to make a decision of backburn. Um, by the time the Premier, I won't say which state, by the time the Premier approved it, the moment was gone and, uh, and, and we couldn't do it. So I, I'm just wondering if, if there are views from an association point of view of whether decisions are held too centrally at the moment and you know, you've got qualified people down in all those decision-making positions. Are decisions appropriately delegated to the appropriate level or not? Mr Wood, please, first, if uh, if you've got a view. I don't want to put you on the spot, yep. but I'm just interested if you have a... a no, 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 that's fine. Um, look, to a, to a large extent in South Australia, I, th I think it's fine. Um, we require the approval of the incident controller to, uh, to light a backburn. Now, that may be um, at a very high level, but in smaller jobs, that, that's at a much lower level. Um, the reason we require that primarily is that, that they are in the best position to have a, um, a good understanding of what the whole fire ground is doing. If um, permission was given at a very low level to light a back burn, that person wouldn't necessarily know what was happening with crews over the other side of the hill or, you know, or, or something like that. So it, 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 there's a risk element involved there. OK, thank you for that. And the timeliness of those decisions, pass him up and back? The, 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 you, the um, people are getting the answers it, and the decisions quick enough? 
All I can say is that it varies. Hmm. No, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mr McDonough? Well, look, I, I think I would agree with uh, Mr Wood on that. Uh, the, the timeliness varies depending on uh, uh, more, or, more or less on individuals and experience. Um, the, the more local knowledge, we'll go back to the, that, that again, the more local knowledge you've got in the incident control and uh, familiarity, if you like, with those in the, in the field, the, the quicker the response typically is. Um, it's when, it's when the, the individuals aren't familiar with the backgrounds of the individuals doing the work on the ground that uh, sometimes you run into delays. And, and certainly in this last uh, season, I had um, a first time uh, person in the operations center um, advising me on how and when I was able to do backburns and, and, and it was fairly obvious he had very little experience of firefighting. So, you know, those are some of the challenges that we, we've come, came across this season in particular. Um, and as you've probably heard in previous e evidence with backburns, sometimes you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So it's a bit of a catch-22 often. Uh, thank you very much. And Mr Barnett. Thank you, Commissioner. I'd look, I'd agree in the familiarity. So that goes back to trust. Um, if, if the various levels that people know each other and familiar, with them and their skills in the background, then things tend to be much quicker. In Victoria, we experienced quite a large emphasis after Black Saturday um, around the incident control centres and I guess putting a lot of the decision making process back into ICCs. And I, I look, it's certainly a strong view amongst volunteers that the pendulum has probably swung a little bit too far in that direction. And certainly the two way communication between incident control and the field. I think it most certainly be strengthened. The the issue around backburning, it's probably one of the most serious things that we do and the risk of it. And unfortunately, with the increasing liability um, these days, um, it's probably the it's the longest thing to get approval for. It, it takes a long time. No, I appreciate that. And I appreciate the honesty uh, of your answers. Thank you. Commissioner McIntosh. Nothing from me, Chair, other than to say thanks for your evidence and thanks for your service. Yeah. Mr. Glover, are we... uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I think we should just pause for a moment yep. to see if any of the parties with leave to appear wish to make an application. Um, I will just check arrangements. No. Um, so, so I'm being told uh, there is no um, nothing from the parties with leave to appear, so that might be an appropriate time to adjourn. Okay, gentlemen, can I thank you on behalf of the Commission for your service uh, and the service of all your members. Uh, you play a significant part to the security of this nation through other means other than uh, and the traditional security forces. But I think uh, you've given us a good idea today uh, what your members go through and, uh, and some of the issues, some of the many issues that face them uh, in doing their duty. So on behalf of us, thank you very much and thank you for joining us this morning. We appreciate that. And you may be excused from the Thank you summit. very much. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are running a little over time, uh, but I, um, we do have another panel before lunch, so I wonder if we could adjourn for uh, 10 or 15 minutes. How about we go for 10 minutes? We'll adjourn until 12.20 Canberra time. All rise. The Royal Commission has adjourned until 12.20 p.m.
Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Glover, killer Thanks. trees and cuddly koalas. I think it was a good lesson out of that last one for standardisation. Um, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. The second panel for today comprises representatives from the Association of Volunteer Bushfire Brigades Western Australia, or as I will be calling it, Bushfire Volunteers WA for short, mm -hmm. the Rural Fire Brigades Association of Queensland, and the Volunteer Firefighters Association of New South Wales. I call Dave Gossage, Justin Chaveau and Brian Williams, who are on the screen. Gentlemen, good uh, afternoon. Actually, it's afternoon here, WA it's not. So uh, good, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. And um, just, so that, Commissioner. just so that everyone's aware, Mr Gossage is wearing prescription glasses. Um, uh, Associate, um, all three members of this panel will take an oath. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chaveau, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Williams, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Gossage, do you swear by Almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Uh, I will commence by asking you a little bit about your organisations and a little bit about you, given you're all volunteer firefighters yourselves. Uh, Mr Gossage, can I start with you, please? Can you tell us a little bit about Bushfire Volunteers WA? Please describe the association and its members. Okay, so in in Western Australia, we're quite unique to the rest of Australia in the, in the emergency services space, where the bushfire volunteers are the only non-government uh, organisation uh, providing an emergency response. Uh, bushfire volunteers, as such, has been around since settlement days, where and, and are built on a foundation of a volu uh, volunteers within the community coming together for a common cause, which is to protect their community, uh, prevent fires, and then also help the community recover. Our fundamental uh, philosophy is um, community, local decision-making, local local uh, resourcing. So um, we've been working un un uh, unofficially up until uh, 1991, where we officially became an incorporated body uh, of volunteers from across the state. And then uh, we we were able to fundraise and get enough money in in 2019 uh, to have our first um, full time person uh, on board um, to cater with the bureaucratic workload that's been uh, forced upon us by all, all all legislative change. We are very clearly a non partisan and and one of the few uh, organisations that are prepared to challenge bad policy. Uh, and really uh, get support from um, from many, and it sometimes results in personal retaliation against us. But we we keep uh, doing what's right for the community at the local level. We've got approximately 550 volunteer bushfire brigades across Western Australia, comprising of approximately 20,000. But um, with our volunteers, because we're we're spontaneous volunteers and community volunteers. Our, our projected number is more like 35,000. So we are formed under the Bushfires Act and uh, and there's se several other state managed agencies like the Fire and Rescue Service, the Volunteer Emergency Services, Marine and SES, but they are controlled by the State Department of Fire and Emergency Services. Um, Mr Gossage, how does the numbers of your members compare to the number of paid firefighters in Western Australia? So, to give you context, uh, if I brought in the other volunteer, so, uh, volunteer groups, 
uh, on, on top, of, top of ours. There's about 35,000 volunteers in Western Australia and there's only t around uh, 1,700 to 2,000 paid um, uh, state members uh, or, you know, that are public servants, firefighters. Um, thank you. Uh, now, you are also a volunteer firefighter yourself. Can you please just describe a little bit about your experience as a volunteer firefighter? I suppose I'm, I'm uh, from my history from when I was born, I was born on a farm uh, just south of Perth and uh, raised on a farm and basically from the time I could walk uh, and, and uh, as a kid I remember jumping on the clutch of the tractor to, to drive for my dad who was fighting the fire off the back with buckets of water. So um, you, you say my history is there uh, long and true. I was taught out fight fires with branches and wet, wet uh, hessian bags and then a knapsack and then the trailer unit and to where we are today. So um, I'm coming up to my 40 years as an official firefighter, but I can assure you I've been doing it a lot longer than that and, and have some great experiences fighting fires around not only Western Australia, but uh, in the eastern states as well. Mm. Whereabouts are you based in... Uh, oh, apologies. Whereabouts are you based in Western Australia? So um, we're, we've got a... Uh, we're leasing a, a small office space in uh, Belmont, where we're at our headquarters, but I, I live southeast of Perth on the base of the foothills in uh, Byford, uh, surrounded by bush. Thank you. Uh, Mr Williams, I'll go to you next. Um, can you please um, describe the um, Volunteer Firefighters Association of New South Wales? Yes, I can. Um, we're a voice for all volunteers within the Rural Fire Service. Um, we do not represent staff. We purely represent volunteers to give them an, an independent voice. Our, our main goals are to improve land management practices throughout the state. Um, we certainly uh, want to see a, a, an increase in the amount of hazard reduction being done. It's very important to us that that's, that's done in an environmentally sustainable way and we fully support indigenous, indigenous land management practices. Um, and, and we promote that quite heavily um, because we believe that gives us the best environmental outcomes and excellent protection for the community. Thank you. Uh, just, another just, role, sorry. Oh, sorry, please continue. Yeah. Another role that, that, that's important to us is that we represent uh, volunteers if they come into conflict with staff, and unfortunately that's that's an increasing problem. Uh, we've currently got 35 uh, cases on our books that we, we're currently helping out. Just to give the Commission some context, um, how many members does the VFFA have? Okay, look, first I'd like to explain there are two organisations that represent volunteers in the state. Um, one represents the volunteers plus the staff, where we purely represent volunteers. The other organisation, when you join the Rural Fire Service, you automatically become a member of the other organisation unless you choose to opt out. We don't have that sort of privilege. To join our organisation, you have to actually opt in. So one, one's automatic, one's an opt-out, the other's an opt-in. So that's the big difference between our two groups. Uh, thank um, you. But I don't think you answered my question. Can you just tell us, for the assistance of the Commission, how many members does the VFFA have? Yes, look, we have 3,800 um, people that have actually joined. Um, but as I say, we represent all volunteers and, and, and people come to us, they don't have to be a member, a signed up member of our organisation. Um, we still support them if they've got a problem that we consider a legitimate problem. Mm, thank you. Um, are all your members volunteers of the Rural Fire Service? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Um, now, I just want to ask uh, you... Oh, apologies. Please continue. Yeah, we, do have, we do have a supporters group as well, um, but our membership is, is volunteers only. But we do have a supporters group. You can join as a supporter, and we have a lot of people doing that now, um, including some... Um, we've just had some major, uh, a major sponsor come on board for our organisation. 
Okay, thank you. So of those 3,800 members you have, are all of those members RFS volunteers? As far as I'm aware, yes. Okay, I, I don't handle the membership base, oh. but as far as I'm aware, they're me members of the RFS. Okay, thank you. Now, um, that's the association. Can you tell the Commission a bit about your experience as a volunteer firefighter? Yes, I certainly can. Uh, I've had 52 years of continuous service. I've been the captain of Carajong Heights in my local area for the last 35 years and, and still ongoing. Um, I was the team leader for the Hawkesbury District Remote Area Firefighting Team, and that team developed the concept of remote area firefighting for the Rural Fire Service. We designed the training and the equipment to be used. Um, I've played all parts uh, 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 within fires. Um, I have a group leader qualification. I've done an incident controller's job, a divisional commander. I'm a prescribed burn supervisor, safety officer, I'm a member of the National Fire Experts Group. I was a panel member of the Independent Hazard Reduction Audit Panel, which was a state government panel. And this will actually be the eighth bushfire inquiry that I've been called to give evidence to. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chavot, uh, can I turn to you finally, please? Can you please explain the RFBAQ, uh, its role and its membership? Certainly. Uh, the Rural Fire Brigades Association Queensland was created to fill a need. Uh, rural Fire Brigades are all formed locally and, and have been done so in Queensland for the last over 70 years. And that's a group of people who get together and say, we want to be able to defend ourselves. So in the beginning was a brigade and, and the brigades are good. To support the brigades, a fire service was created. So the fire service exists to support the brigades to be able to defend the communities. And the fire service identified that they, as a fire service, were not structured in a way to talk to brigade members and to get their feedback and what their desires were to, to be able to defend their communities better. So from that, the Rural Fire Brigades Association Queensland was born. So in Queensland, you have two organisations that support rural fire brigades. One's the service and one is the RFBAQ. The RFBAQ have 18 elected brigade representatives across the state, and that forms the state executive. The state executive uh, from there is drawn a board, and I report to the board. So the Rural Fire Brigades Association Queensland, its, its objects are very, very simple. It's we exist to consider and make representation in matters affecting the welfare and efficiency of rural fire brigades and brigade members and to provide financial assistance and support to rural fire brigades and their brigade members. Uh, it's something as an organisation that I believe we do very, very well um, and have supplied this year over one and a half million dollars worth of support and equipment to brigades. We also have six trucks we uh, have built, six land cruisers that are going around the state that will be given to brigades without trucks. And we're just finishing the construction of almost a million dollars worth of two heavy trucks, one for Birdsville and one for Burketown, which are remote communities. Uh, thank the, you. The RFB, yep. Oh, sorry, I was just going to ask, um, how many rural fire brigades um, are there in Queensland? Sort of how, what areas of the state do they cover? And third question, uh, are they all members of your organisation? Yes. So I'll, I'll answer your f the third question first. All brigades are deemed to be members of the Rural Fire Brigades Association. So every brigade is a member. We represent all the brigades and the brigade members. There are 1,400 rural fire brigades in Queensland. It covers 93% of the land mass of Queensland. So not only do the brigades have uh, quantity, but brigades also have quality. We, the Rural Fire Brigades, don't just do hazard reduction burning, which is one of the key things that brigade members do, which is help landholders manage their risk. In Queensland, if you own land, you are responsible for that land and you are also responsible for that fire. So in Queensland, the brigade exists to help landholders manage their risk and also to fight fires. The Rural Fire Brigades in Queensland do a, a huge amount of hazard reduction burning. Um, rural fire brigades also do response and recovery as well. Queensland is probably the most disaster prone state in the Commonwealth. So the rural fire brigades, having over 1,000 yellow trucks in the fleet, um, are, are able to be the largest 
um, response and recovery organisation in the state, and the brigades do fire, flood, cyclone, anything their local community needs, the Rural Fire Brigade will be there because a Rural Fire Brigade is born and drawn from that individual community. Just in, in, in closing on that, that means that Rural Fire Brigades in Queensland, the 1,400 of them, all look different because they all meet their individual community needs. In Queensland, you cannot join the Rural Fire Service. You join your brigade. So you are a member of your brigade. You are not a member of the fire service. That allows a large amount of autonomy and self-will for that community to meet its own local needs. Uh, thank you. So if, uh, just to tease out that point, because I think that's quite a bit different to certainly arrangements in Victoria and New South Wales, um, if I uh, was a person in Queensland who wanted to join a brigade, how would I go about doing that? A, a rural fire brigade is an unincorporated association, so it's like a faith community. So you are joining that individual club and you are an equal member of the club with everybody else. So my brigade, we have a meeting on Monday night at seven o'clock, this Monday coming, if anyone's on the Sunshine Coast and wants to join up. And what will happen is new members will come along there and we will, we will talk to them to discuss what we do as a rural fire brigade and how we defend the community. And then we as a brigade will then vote to let the person in or not. So it's, it's, a, it's a choice of the collective. Once the, the, the brigade, the tribe has made that choice and said, yes, we want you to come and help us defend our community from everything that happens, then the whole paperwork cycle starts with the induction and, and then the fire being joined, getting a volunteer number from the fire service, where the fire service says, yes, we will allow this person to join your brigade and we will cover them for workers' compensation and we will help train them and equip them. Uh, thank you. Um, now, I should not pass from you before I hear a little bit more about your experience as a volunteer firefighter. Um, my brigade, like every other brigade, there was a fire in the street and no one came, so no fire service came, so the locals went and put the fire out and they went, well, there needs to be a better way of doing this, so let's start a rural fire brigade. Again, that's how most brigades started, from a community need. Dad was one of the people who, who went to that fire and had that first meeting, and so there wasn't a lot going on where I grew up. There, there, was, there was a shop. Uh, and so the only thing that was really going on were the, the people in the Rural Fire Brigade uh, trying to get equipment. So we started off with um, a trailer tied behind, tied behind Dad's vehicle with some knapsacks and some beaters in it. And then we went and bought a 1942 Chevy Blitz, which was the mullet truck off the North Shore. And the local Morton Mill in Nambour gave us a molasses tank and we put it on the back. And, and that was our first truck. Um, and when I was 16, so Dave was saying, you know, he, he, he must have been a big kid because there wasn't really um, a, an age of joining. And, and so it was decided at 16 a month from by the brigade members that I was now old enough or tall enough to ride the truck. Um, and that was in 1986. So I have been volunteering with my brigade uh, for the last 34 years. Thank you. Um, I think the answers uh, given to just that introductory uh, series of questions demonstrate the diversity of views and the complex range of interests at play. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to ask you some questions now about volunteering and volunteerism. Um, uh, Mr Gossage, may I start with you? Can I ask you about um, whether your organisation has identified any trends in volunteer firefighter numbers? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? What is the age of volunteers? Um, certainly, uh, we're seeing um, the average age of volunteers, um, it's actually creeping up. Um, but since the uh, inception of um, uh, the DFES organisation, uh, we've also noticed, uh, you know, quite a large percentage, and someone told me the other day, I think it's around 14% uh, decrease in membership uh, since since that uh, centralised control mod model was forced upon us all. So it's certainly um, something that um, ha does affect volunteering. And, and I suppose when I was reflecting on, on uh, 
on all of this and, and its effect. It comes down, uh, and if you relate to Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, uh, is a good principle of what volunteering is all about. It's about feeling safe and, um, you know, basic desires for, for food and survival. And then there's the psychological needs of self-esteem and wanting to make a make a difference in the community. And certainly, um, you know, that that's the ethos of volunteerism. And and um, we we've seen a trend, uh, and and I suppose the Ferguson report highlighted a number of issues uh, in that space where it talked about culture. And, and when the, there's two cultures, there's an industrial control culture, which is the State Department uh, called DFES in WA, and then there's the bushfire culture and, and volunteer culture separately. So one is, one is about command and control, and, and ours is about trust and respect. And what we've seen is with this, uh, with the command and control model, uh, they've now got control of all the state funding and so they can just hand out the crumbs to, to others. To give you an idea, there's an emergency services levy in Western Australia. Um, I think this year is around $404 million uh, being collected and, um, over, and, and out, of, out of that, around $220 million of that goes into employee benefits, which is that minority group and the local governments who look after the volunteer bushfire brigades and SES, we get to share 33 million of that, so about 8%. And, and if you have a look at some of our evidence we've already submitted, um, you'll see that the trends of the charts. Uh, when ESL was introduced in 2003 and 2004, uh, the local government bushfire brigades and SES were getting around 17% of the ESL. Now, 2017-18, we're down to 5.64% of the total ESL gathered. So you can see the trends of centralised control. Um, uh, once they get that control, they get control of the money and then they start to change the messaging. So they can use the emergency services levy for, for their media campaigns, their staff and resources. But a local government and bushfire brigades uh, were not allowed it. They, they've got a manual that controls what we can and can't have, and it's just the basic stuff. So if you're on their side of the fence, you'll get four sets of PPE, uniforms and all the bling to look good. Uh, on our side of the fence, we get one, one set of PPE, and then we have to fundraise for the rest. So um, there's huge disparity and differences about... Uh, what we do, yet in the fire ground we stand side by side and I see many photos of us volunteers standing alongside of a guy wearing breathing apparatus. And so the state agency has changed the rules to take that ability for us to protect ourselves away. So, um, you know, and they're controlling the outcomes quite quite rigorously. So I suppose um, what, what, what we're seeing is, is uh, we're we're being minecrafted or, or, or learned into a command and control structure, which actually destroys resilience and local community capacity uh, in the longer term. And, and the, that point is lost everywhere because the agencies in all the states that control um, the, um, the, the funding and the advice going to governments are all controlled by industrial bodies who don't share the view of, of volunteers. And, and if you look nationally, there's about 30,000 paid firefighters and locally, uh, sorry, and nationally, there's 250,000 volunteers uh, protecting this nation. And the decision-making process and funding process is very disproportionate and favoured to the minority. And that has a direct effect on volunteerism because they say, as I was at meetings two nights ago, with a whole group of different brigades from different areas saying, what is the point in fighting these guys? It's a union controlled organisation and it's, it's destroying our ability to make local decisions at the local level. And, and basically what we're seeing in the last decade is through their, their centralised control model is they're mind crafting the community in, and, and teaching them not to be resilient. Uh, and and we, we've got to turn that trend around. And, the last time we saw a resilient community was back in uh, uh, the World War II times, where uh, post-war 
all the communities came together and it's a bit like the philosophy of what Justin does uh, in Queensland, uh, that we actually, um, you know, you've got to get off your bum and make a difference, work hard, get results. Nowadays, the philosophy is one of work hard and find somebody to blame. So that is disempowering the communities and directly affecting uh, volunteerism. Miss, uh, thank you for that extensive answer, Mr Gossage. Can I just uh, raise a couple of points? You referred to the Ferguson report. Is that the, Fergu is that the uh, Waruna bushfire special inquiry into the January 2016 Waruna fire? Yeah, that's correct. And, yeah. and if you look at um, around uh, that's, page... That's, that's OK. Thank you. Um, I just wanted... I, I'm conscious that we I've unfortunately don't have a lot of time, so I'll try to move through this quite quickly. Um, in relation to the emergency services levy, is it right that funds raised by the emergency services levy are not directed solely to firefighting but are directed to all identified natural hazards? Yeah, so the emergency services levy, uh, when it was originally introduced to Parliament, the intent was to fund response um, activities in a combined way, all natural okay. hazards, yeah. fires, floods. OK, or, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and um, is the way that ESL is imposed done through a statutory process whereby local governments assess the needs of the local government area? and then make submissions about the quantum of the levy to be imposed on residents? Um, the, the original intent was along those lines, but um, it's now morphed into uh, DFES uh, developing a manual that they think we need and then sending that out to the local governments, telling them what they can and can't have, even if it's not what the local government wants or needs for their bushfire brigades and their CS. OK, thank so you. So they've uh, become controlled. Thank you. Mr Williams, can I just ask you um, whether you have any observations about trends in volunteering in um, your members who are members of the RFS? Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, what we're seeing of late, and it's been going on for a number of years now, is that really experienced people are becoming disenchanted and they're leaving the service. And and that's very unfortunate because in the bushfire game, you need a lifetime of experience to learning all the, all the time. So those people are getting disenchanted. And the main reason for that is there's been a loss of local control and input. Um, the rural fire service has, has become quite a, a city-centric organisation and uh, there's been a considerable loss of control at the local level and um, and, and and what's happening there, um, the fire situations are becoming more dangerous because of increased fuel loads um, and experienced volunteers feel it, it's time to give it away. Um, people don't want to be responsible for somebody, a crew being burnt um, and uh, they just get disenchanted, they've lost their local control, their, their input isn't valued like it used to be when we were under local government and they're tending to walk away and that's very unfortunate. Thank you Mr Williams. Um, Mr Chavot, what have you observed in Queensland about trends in volunteer firefighters? I think that as a percentage of population, the the volunteering numbers are stable. With the depopulation of some areas in Queensland, spe specifically the West, we see brigade number brigade membership there decline due to the declining base of the population. But we're also seeing a great interest in volunteering in the higher population density areas. Uh, the recent Pridgin fires are an excellent example of that. Uh, there were 104 trucks on the fire ground within an hour. Think of that, 104 trucks on the fire ground at one fire within an hour. So along the coastal seaboard, we're seeing a lot of very, very active truck brigades, high brigade membership. They're able to fight their own fires, but also to export power, weight of attack to other areas in Queensland that, that are having large fires and also manage their own risk as well. So as a percentage of population, it's stable, but the, 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 
I suppose the demographic of the state is changing and the brigades are changing to meet that. I want to qualify that with out of the 1400 brigades, we have 750 truck brigades and then we have primary producer brigades in Queensland as well. A primary producer brigade, most of them don't have vehicles. We've got a three and a half thousand mop up or slip on units, they're called in the state, which is when there's a fire locally, you put it on the back of your own ute, fill it up with water. You've just made your own vehicle a fire engine in the eyes of the law. Uh, and that allows locals to go and jump on a fire very, very quickly, manage their own risk. And there's also, because there's so much of it, there's capacity for them to come together. We also have in those primary producer brigades, what we call cane brigades, they're the cane farmers. So in a lot of these areas where we have the cane brigades, they have 100% of the population are also brigade members. Everyone is a brigade member as well. And they use the rural fire brigades to manage their own risk. So in Queensland, a brigade really is still that grassroots, this is, this is what I need to be able to defend myself, so I will make a brigade around that need. We're seeing changes in, let's say, behind the Whit Sundays, where we've got landholders who are primary producers who uh, are selling up, and we've got people who are moving in who, who don't come from the land but the risk still remains the same. Those people are still joining their brigades, but because they don't have their own ute, we're seeing grant applications come in from, uh, for them to be for trailers, so they can put the slip-on unit in a trailer and tow it behind their vehicle. So the rural fire in Queensland as a collective, which is the brigades, the fire service and the RFBAQ, are really right now trying to meet those changes in society because the thing that is not going away is the risk, is the fuel load. Um, the, the, the rural fire in Queensland, I, I suppose what you would call it is a very broad church. And that's, and that's fantastic. We've got everything from the primary producer, the Cane Brigade, all the way up to brigades. A Green Bank Rural Fire Brigade has a truck with a hoist and a large animal sling on it because they do a lot of horse recovery down there because it's a very horsey area. Now that's all paid for by the local community. We have Wasp Creek Rural Fire Brigade has a boat. There was a fire the other night on the Broadwater at the Gold Coast and, and again paid for by the local community. Wasp Creek boat went out. So this is the flexibility that rural fire in Queensland has. It is quite dynamic but the support the brigades are getting is excellent from their rural fire paid staff who come from the brigades and things that are in plentiful supply as P2 masks, boots, helmets, things like that. But it's that next level of protection and that next level of brigade choice in what they want to do in the community that is not being well met. And I, and I think it's not being well met for a couple of reasons. One is funding. And the other one is the desire or the ability of the service, which is a paramilitary organisation, to meet the changing needs of dynamic community organisations. So psychometrically, I think you've got two, two separate things that are rubbing against each other, and it's not always finding the best result for that local community. Uh, thank you. Um can I just ask you each um, briefly about um, whether there's a potential role of the Australian government in encouraging, maintaining and strengthening volunteer arrangements? Uh, Mr Gossage, I'll start with you. Yes, um, certainly there is uh, on a number of fronts and, and I'd say the first one is the nation is in, in desperate need of industrial law reform um, to stop um, what, what we see here and I'm seeing happening, especially in Victoria, where the union has got control of the state agency and the government are subservient to the, to the union movement. Okay, so, so Mr Gossage, I think... can I just ask, my question was a little more specific about the particular role of volunteers what the Australian oh, government yes. could do in relation to volunteers? Uh, one of the first things the federal government should do now, and it's very um, time critical that they need to do it, is to bring in a Volunteer Respect Act. 
that prevents um, industrial bodies from bring, bringing in EBAs that make volunteers subservient and, and, and the, the uh, Volunteer Respect Act needs to ensure that no state law can be done that will have a detrimental effect on volunteerism and volunteers um, doing their job without fear or favour. Thank you. I, that I think you might have stolen... Oh, apologies. I think you might have stolen Mr Chavot's, um <laughs> thunder there because I think it is a stated... Uh, object of the RFBAQ uh, for this notion of a Volunteer Respect Act. Can I just pass to Mr Chavot? I'm, apologies, gentlemen, I'm conscious we're running out of time. Um, Mr Chavot, do you I, just I'd want like to give to... your perspective on that, please? And then I'll go to Mr uh, Williams. Uh, thank you for the lead in, Mr Glover, and, and thank you, Dave, for supporting the Emergency Volunteer Respect Act. Uh, the Rural Fire Brigade volunteers aren't covered by an industrial instrument or, or any workplace enterprise or bargaining, and neither they should be. This isn't about unionism. It's, that's not why people volunteer. But what, what can happen and what does happen to brigade volunteers is their workplace is manifestly changed uh, by a decision without any engagement or any requirement for an engagement like you would with an employee who was covered under enterprise bargaining or some industrial tool. The other thing that doesn't exist right now is if, if the Prime Minister or if the Federal Government said, we want to know what emergency volunteers want, what's affecting them uh, and what we can do as a Federal Government for them better in the, in the, fu in the future. There is no mechanism available right now for, for that answer, a question to be put in and for an answer to come back out. So we'd see that an Emergency Volunteer Respect Act is not punitive. It's a, it's a piece of legislation that is used to allow federally the federal government to ask the different state-based organisations in relation to how they can be supported by the federal government to better support their communities, hmm. but also what hazards or challenges are emerging in states or territories that could then become a national issue that's hunted off sooner rather than then 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 we have a disaster and then we have a royal commission or an inquiry into it um, it is one of the five stated goals of the rural fire brigades association it's also an objective of the council of australian volunteer fire associations that we we pursue this volunteer respect act in queensland i've spoken to the state government about it and and there's a number of different pieces of legislation in queensland that cover volunteers because you just don't come under um, the QFES, you can also come under health because we have first responders in ambulance. We have emergency volunteers would come under Department of Communities and they're all covered by different pieces of legislation. So even if you amended everyone's legislation to look the same, we all know that over time, departmental legislation grows organically. They change, so it will change away from that initial intent. So if you had one piece of overarching, simple, small piece of legislation, there would be the purity of the intent maintained. Uh, I would also, if I could suggest that you would not name an organisation, you would, you would have functions of what an emergency volunteer is and does. And so different organisations would be able to migrate in and out of coverage of this piece of legislation due to their form and function, not by name. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Chavot. Uh, Mr Williams, is there any comment you wanted to make on that or, or address the question, the more general question, which is um, what role should the Australian government have in encouraging, maintaining and strengthening volunteer arrangements? Yeah, certainly. Look, in New South Wales, when, when we were under local government, we were highly respected, our, our opinions were sought, and we had a great deal of say in what happened. Since we've got under the bureaucracy, uh, there's a, a feeling, a, a growing feeling that we're no longer respected, we're no longer important, we're just there to, be, to do as we're told. And, uh, and when you're asking people to do a very difficult, dangerous job and give their time free, um, I think the most important thing we can give them is, is, is respect. And, uh, and anything that could, could improve the respect for the volunteer would be a, a great step forward and help with recruiting and, and retaining um, personnel. Yeah, I agree. As, as, as far as the um, assistance from the, um, from the federal government, 
Um, there's certainly a role for the federal government to play in supporting what volunteers do. And in the past, I've used, um, or, or my district has used army engineers to build containment lines, and that worked extremely well. And that was back in 1979. Um, in uh, 94, I had 90 RAF personnel from the local RAF base assigned to me, um, and I used them to c construct containment lines, and that proved very successful. So certainly there's a support role um, in, in major uh, fires to be played by the federal government, I believe. Uh, thank you, Mr Williams. Um, I now wanted to ask each of you a specific question about interoperability, particularly with respect to interstate or intrastate deployments. Um, and uh, Mr. And, and I'll ask you, and then I will invite the others to comment. Uh, Mr. Williams, can I just ask you about training in relation to volunteer firefighters? Um, we've heard evidence this morning, and indeed the Royal Commission's received responses to its issues paper that suggests um, that there is a national training framework for volunteer firefighters, but that its application varies across jurisdictions. Do you have any comment you'd like to make on that? Look, I don't have enough um, knowledge to know what the level of training is in the, in the other states. All I can say is that when um, interstate people come to assist, um, they seem well trained, well skilled, and uh, as long as you put a local person with them, um, I've never had a problem with it in, in my 52 years um, of using other people. Uh, as long as you put a local person with them, um, we very quickly adapt and get along and, and, and very supportive of one another. Mm. I agree. Thank you. And I was just going to. Um uh, throw to you, Mr. Chavot. I saw you nodding, which unfortunately doesn't make its way onto the transcript. So, is there anything you'd like to add in relation to Mr. Williams's answer? Uh, I agree 100%. Uh, rural fire brigades are all about local knowledge. In big disasters, we we welcome everybody from all the other states and territories to come to Queensland. And even though the fittings on the back of the trucks um, may be different from what they have in different states and the shape of the trucks. Even internally, the fittings on our own trucks in the fire service vary from vehicle to vehicle. So to have that local person there to give the, the, the visitors who have come to help us an awareness of how our vehicles work and, and, and get a familiarisation with it, and then have that local knowledge on the fire ground. Because the only person who knows that when a fire gets to the bottom of the hill on this side, it goes out. And so put all your trucks around the other side because it went, if it gets down to the bottom of the hill there, it'll be gone for a week, mm. is a local person because they've fought those fires before and they understand the local conditions. Mm. One, one of the things that we found in the, in the, not last year, but the year before the big fires up in Mackay was that we had brigade volunteers come from Western Australia. Uh, and thank you very much. And they came for a week. But the local brigades up there were saying that all they, they had enough volunteers locally what they just needed was a couple of more trucks. And so the effort that was that was undertaken by the fire service to um, support these volunteer firefighters from Western Australia to come over, to accommodate them, to put them in trucks, to familiarise them uh, on the fire ground. And, and the locals are saying they spent one and a half days on the fire ground in that whole week was not necessarily what the locals wanted. So first step is consulting that local knowledge about what do you need or what do you foresee you need in the future as part of the logistical train? Because really a fire service above your local command and control is a logistical train. So what support do you need instead of transposing support without asking the local incident controllers? Thank you. Um, Mr Gossage, I saw you nodding along as well. Uh, do you have any comment to make about the... Um, approach to training of volunteer firefighters? Uh, yes, certainly, um, you know, for what, what the Commonwealth can do is actually uh, undertake a nice review of, of the national framework and, and the training uh, rules that seem to change about every two years. But, um, and then ha that has a repercussion all the way down to the, the end user, which is us on the ground. And it's become so bureaucratic and um, what I would call, um, you know, paid 
paid uh, officer centric, they've lost touch with the reality of volunteerism and what what the true uh, what volunteers at a local level need. Um, and so we, we need to get that um, revisited. And there's no on that decision making process. Whilst uh, we have a small, uh, a very small impact through through AFAC, uh, at the end of the day, it's still the state agencies that make the final determination, which is at times uh, contrary to what the volunteers on the ground actually need or want. And so it makes it. So I can give it examples that you know in WA a pathway system was uh, brought in that created pathways for the paid people. And then they said, oh, shivers, we forgot about the volunteers and shoved them on. But the way it was structured, it was structured so volunteers will always be subservient to the paid public servants. And that's, that's insulting when we have volunteers who are running multi-million dollar corporations and businesses and mines and all that being treated like, like uh, fodder and only used when we want them to. And now... It's so entrenched that a volunteer can't ever get up to a, a level three. I used to be a level three um, um, person now, but that, that right as a volunteer has been taken away by, me, by the state's system. Yeah, uh, Mr Glossage, just um, describe to us what, it, what you mean by uh, uh, level three. So uh, nationally for all emergencies, fire, flood, storm and that, you have level one incidents, which is your local level incidents that the locals look after, the level two is when, when that region or, or that shire's area is, is getting to, uh, expect, you know, it's got to a point where uh, it needs help from outside joining shires or regions. Uh, and then the level three is something that is of, of a state-wide, uh, having a statewide impact on resources uh, and, and funding and the like. So um, the only other thing in the training space is, you know, being, having real end user volunteers, lay, lay people on the, on the training structure process would be a good thing at a federal level and that should be something that they should do as part of the review. But also one thing that always gets forgotten is this, every time like we're doing what we're doing here today, we as volunteers work for ourselves, uh, we lose a lot of money and there's no funding for us to, to travel around and provide advice at a federal level and uh, yet the state agencies out of these emergency services levy fund, you know, accommodation, meals, travel, everything for them and we don't get anything. And, and I just find that uh, when, when there's 250,000 volunteers across Australia having to self-fund to have input and then, then the final decision maker is, is the paid fraternity, uh, I, I just find that nearly degrading for, for volunteerism, community resilience a lot. Does that make, does that um, evidence you've just given also apply to the time volunteers actually spend fighting the fires themselves? We heard some evidence from the first panel that um, there seemed to be a consensus between those witnesses that um, there should be some arrangement to cover volunteers out of pockets. Is that essentially what your evidence was sure. to the effect of just then? Certainly our position um, in our state as volunteers is no, we do not do not want to be paid because being paid means you've got to be subservient to the bureaucracy. What we do want is that no volunteer should be worse off or out of pocket. And what we mean by that is if, if um, a small business um, lets their volunteers uh, go to a fire or a flood or a storm or whatever, that, that there's a mechanism in place to support that small business to keep going because small businesses in, in uh, the broad WA context is the backbone of the state. And, and if you start affecting small business, it starts affecting local communities, long-term sustainability, resilience and local capacity. Yeah. So it's about not being worse off, yeah. and, and, but not about directly paying. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Mr Gossage. I'll move to Mr Williams now and just ask if you've got any comment on uh, that topic we were just discussing about um, payment versus compensation for volunteers. Yeah, look, I pretty well agree with everything that Dave just said. Um, there should be some, like, 
we all lost in these last buyers in particular, we all lost a lot of money being volunteers. Um, it's difficult for employers. Um, I think there should be some form of compensation for employers that let their staff go. Um, a lot of my people in my brigade are self-employed people and, and they, they had significant financial losses. Um, there should be some some form of compensation, I believe, in once a person does more than so many days, they, they, there should be some sort of a reward. If it was a reward in they didn't have to pay, pay the fire levy on their insurance or they got a, a rebate on registration, it doesn't necessarily have to be a cash payment, but I think there should be some incentive once people do more than so many days. Um, and, and the other thing where I think compensation should come in, um, in New South Wales, we had 70 odd firefighters lose their own home. I think those people, there should be a, a system in place. If someone's killed, injured or lose their home while they're at a, tent, at a fire, there should be some automatic payment system to see that they don't suffer because of that. Thank so you, you shouldn't have to jump through hoops to get compensation. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I'm um, finally to you, Mr. Chavot. Did you want to make any comment about that issue? The question about compensation and, and financial payment for brigade volunteers has come to Rural Fire Brigades Association general meetings a number of times in previous years. So every now and then it comes up as an agenda item uh, and the consensus consistently from the elected representatives who have changed over time was that's not why people volunteer. But because volunteers are so different, as, as Brian and Dave and everyone else has been saying, and some are self-employed and some are employees of the state, is that one answer doesn't fit everybody. And that's and we, we will need to develop a, a suite of different options that aren't around just financial um, support. And I've heard things like, oh, well, you should have rates relief if you're a brigade member. Well, I think we'll see my brigade membership go from 40 brigade members to 4,000 brigade <laughs> members, um, and but we'll still have 40 people out fighting the fight. So uh, it's it's probably a perfect question for asking the through the Emergency Volunteer Respect Act. This would be exactly why the act would exist. One of the one of the things we did find that constrained volunteering in the last fire season was the amount of notice the brigade volunteers were given to go away on strike teams. So they would hear from their local Rural Fire Service Queensland area office or their local Rural Fire Brigade group, um, we are we want looking for brigade volunteers to go away on a strike team for five days or a week, leaving tomorrow or, or leaving in a day and a half. All these requests would come in on a Saturday. Now that didn't leave brigade volunteers any time to get onto their employer or for their employer to backfill when the brigade volunteer was away. Do we know that it's taking a certain amount of time for the machine to process these national support applications when they come in? And what, what it saw was a drawdown in a couple of different reasons. One is you had brigade volunteers who were annoyed because they wanted to go, but there wasn't enough time given to to, to contact their employer or put their affairs in order. and there was an obligation felt by brigade volunteers who went over and over and over again because their brigade, they wanted to have their brigade represented. So we weren't using the full depth of our volunteer capacity. We've got 33,000 brigade members in Queensland. We, we, in the last big fire season, did not find ourselves wanting to be able to fight our own fires and also to export brigade volunteers to other states and territories. But the load was carried by too few of those 33,000 people, not because many others didn't want to go. It's just the time, it, was, it wasn't done in a volunteer friendly way and there wasn't enough time given because the amount of time it took for the request to process through the machine down to brigade level was too long. And that's, and that's a fix that doesn't cost any money but will create a better volunteer experience and also broaden out the base of volunteers we already have. Thank you um, for those answers. Uh, gentlemen, I'm conscious of the time. I could um, no doubt continue to talk to you all for some hours, um, but I will ask the commissioners if they have any questions. 
Okay, a couple of questions, Commissioner Bennett. I just have one question, just to clarify something, Mr. Gossage. You referred at the very beginning or very early on in your evidence to the uh, the fact that volunteers were fighting next to um, paid. Um, firefighters, uh, the latter having breathing apparatus and the volunteers not having breathing apparatus. And Mr Chabot, you talked about um, people getting uh, machinery and, and putting it on the back of their trucks and getting, you know, going off and uh, uh, providing that, that uh, th those uh, possibilities themselves. Um, I just guess I wanted to understand, um, Mr Gossage, does, is there any, any way, I mean, breathing apparatus is fairly basic when you're fighting a fire, so are you saying that um, there is no provision of breathing apparatus at all to volunteers? And secondly, and this brings Mr Chabot and of course Mr Williams in, if you do go out and buy it yourself, um, is there a process whereby you can be reimbursed for that? As an example of other yeah. equipment, I understand, but I'm just picking on breathing apparatus because you mentioned it. Yes, um, certainly. Uh, bushfire brigades um, are charged with fighting all fires, whether it be a, a bushfire, a car fire, a house fire, whatever, out in, in the, in the rural, rural uh, community. Um, uh, and we've had a number of uh, bushfire brigades that have got and still got BA today. However, now that one department has been put in charge of all the, all the funding and expenditure and rules around that, uh, this year, um, without any consultation, they changed the, the, the so-called manual um, that took that ability for local governments and the brigades to apply for funding through the emergency services levy, which now then puts it back on the volunteers to fundraise for breathing apparatus, which is a basic safety, safety things. The, 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 the department said to us that, oh, you can have it so long as you come under our command and control. That is just blatant bullying and abuse of power to actually use uh, that, you know, control of the money to get people to come under their command and control. So, so just, it will just destroy to, unity resilience. So just to clarify that, if you if you then go and buy your own breathing apparatus, can you get can you claim reimbursement from from the state? No, they won't. They won't let you. You've got to you've got to follow. You've got to do as you're told and follow their rules. Okay, thank because you. Because they are now the judge, jury, and executioner. Thank you, Mr. Gossage. Uh, Mr. Chavot, what's the situation in Queensland? The we've got this 1,400 brigades. We have 750 truck brigades, and as I spoke before, we've got the primary producer brigades. That's a really efficient way for local people to meet their local community needs. Now, if you were to say to those 750 brigades. Do you all want fire trucks? They'll go no, and, and that's the, what we're going through in the process right now. Um, is that they find this is a very efficient, convenient way for the local people to meet their local community needs. But when they what do, can they claim reimbursement? I think is the question. I'm, if, if they decide they need a particular sort of um, uh, fire truck or something like that, and they do provide it themselves, can they claim reimbursement at all? If you put your slip-on unit on the back of your own vehicle and you go to a fire and your and your vehicle is damaged, um, then it will come under the fire service insurance. So they will uh, help you with that insurance claim. And just on the back of this own fire season, we've with a we we got agreement from the fire service that because with primary producers they need those vehicles for their work for the first time, they will also be given a hire car to be able to continue their business with it. With, with brigades in Queensland, most or many brigades have a bank account, and into that bank account goes the rural fire levy that's collected by council, so that is not public money. That is council money for the brigade to use to purchase equipment for purposes. And also, when you make a donation to your local rural fire brigade, if you do it through us, it's tax deductible, then that's brigade money. So the brigades then have the option to purchase equipment. Now, the RFBAQ and the fire service, we have an agreement called brigade owned equipment. So that's where the brigade buys it. I see. The fire service, the fire service guarantees to insure it and underwrite it. And then at the end of that piece of equipment's life, the brigade can dispose of it because it's not government equipment and the brigade can buy some others. So that's a good deal for the government because they don't have to buy the equipment. All they have to do is underwrite it when it's in the brigade's care. And it's a good deal for the brigade because it allows that, that, that self, the, the meeting your own local needs. Thank the fire you. service does supply equipment though. So rural fire brigades in Queensland are most definitely not on their own. 
the fire service supplies vehicles, standardised equipment, and there's a, a rural fire stores list where brigades can order equipment free of charge from the state. Thank you very much indeed. Mr Williams. Um, in the rural fire service, um, the only time we use breathing apparatus is at a, a, a structure fire and only some brigades have that and uh, the the training is quite intensive and the upkeep and the cost of doing it breathing apparatus for bush firefighters wouldn't be a viable option it would be too heavy and, and too and and you couldn't work well enough the only thing where you we've been issued is a simple mask like people are wearing in this pandemic um, and the rural fire services is looking at upgrading that a little bit it's still under investigation so a lot of people did suffer smoke um, difficulties um, so an improved uh, mask would be better but we certainly couldn't use breathing apparatus for all our bushfire work that, that wouldn't be feasible. But what is envisaged if they do upgrade the facilities that the rural fire service will provide that to the volunteers? Yeah, just a bit of a be better quality mask that, that filters a little bit better. Thank you very much. That, that's all they look for. Thank you and thank you very much for your evidence and for everything that you do. Commissioner McIntosh. Nothing from me, Chair. Only just thanks for your evidence and thanks for your service. Thank you. Um, I have one question, I'll, and I'll start with Mr Gossage, only because it was uh, something that came out of previous evidence, and I think it was the Swan Valley Council we had on early on, and they talked about a disparity in uh, information available and therefore situational awareness to be able to respond to an incident, and I think it was... Ber DFES had one system and that information system was not available to the council and the volunteer groups and therefore there was an inconsistency in information and situational awareness between the groups to be able to, uh, to address the concern, in this case a, a, a fire. It, did I interpret that right? And then Mr Gossage, then if you can give me a quick answer and I'll actually ask the other to representatives here about whether there's an issue with information services and all that uh, uh, as well. Yeah, yes, certainly. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, the department, uh, DFES, is putting um, technology and iPads and everything into their uh, their paid public service vehicles, um, but the the fire trucks that are be, being funded out of the same funding pool. For volunteers don't get that same uh, equipment in them off the shelf so we have a situation where the paid fraternity is is fully situational aware and, and part of their justification for getting them was to bring situational awareness for for the crews on the ground yet it's okay for the paid to have that but we as volunteers uh, are prevented from having that because they are the judge, jury and execution of the decision-making process. So what that is essentially doing is, is putting the volunteers at risk because the department's seeing one lot of information and the volunteers can't have direct visibility of that. And, and, and the consequence of that is um, there's a, a massive disparity of, of information flow and, and that could put our volunteers at great risk, which is what does happen from time to time. And, and I'm assuming the effectiveness of then a response in not having the situational awareness that you would, uh, oh. you would think? Oh, absolutely. Um, and, and certainly in the bushfire uh, world, um, you know, we, we still use the UHF because a lot of bushfire brigades are, are still farmer response brigades. And so um, as you're driving to a, if once you see smoke and you're driving towards it, you're trying to gather as much information as you can. So by the time you get to the fire, you're fully uh, informed as you can be about what's happening, where it's going, what the weather's like, uh, where do I, where's the safest place to start tackling this beast, you know, because at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, information is, is uh, time critical. And uh, from a volunteer who's putting their life on the line to save strangers on a daily basis, that's the least we could do as a, as a nation is get technology into all our vehicles. A big challenge we've got in Western Australia is that there's a lot of areas where uh, the some technology doesn't work and we've got a lot of black holes. So we need to be looking at other 
um, opportunities at a federal level to support the local, uh, and when I mean local, the money getting down to the volunteer brigades on the ground, not being filtered off between the federal and, and us, um, getting directly to us to make a difference. And we need to be looking at other new technology that is, you know, maybe even something like satellite. Agree. No, thank you very much for that. Mr Chavot, uh, you're nodding again for the record. Similar, similar question. Now, information systems and situational awareness, do you have a consistency you of availability across the force or, or disparity or, or whatever? What do you use? We're, cl we're closing the gap. Uh, we, uh, we've, we've just finished raising $400,000 from the RFBAQ for bushfire mapping tablets with the fire service. So they've now arrived in the country and our plan is very soon to roll out one bushfire mapping tablet to every truck brigade in the state and that will for the first time allow them to access uh, within their trucks state funded mapping tablets mapping systems and also real time where when we get avl which automatically vehicle locators which we currently don't have we would then be able to the you would able to be able to see on a map where you are on the fire ground where everybody else is on the fire ground you'd be able to map and share hazards on the fire ground to the other brigades and incident controllers there and also map real time the 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 planes that are there supporting you we in queensland are supported by firecom so we have one call out agency uh, there's one firecom for each region which means that they have a local awareness of the local brigades um, and and also who are in the brigades and their local um, challenges communication challenges as well and we work on that common platform the brigades love their firecoms because firecom will do anything for a brigade member uh, at any time but that brings us down to i suppose as dave was talking about satellite queensland is pretty much a black spot and then there's certain levels of coverage within that, that black spot um, and and we our hard infrastructure we have fires we have cyclones we have floods when those things happen we lose the hard infrastructure we have to power it, we have to upgrade it we would love to be able to go to the satellite not just for sat phone but also for our communications and for these bushfire mapping tablets so we are then able to track the brigades um, the council glover asked a question previously um, what what could be done if for queensland in the future um, it's not just satellite coverage, it's a satellite. So if, if, if you as the commissioner were able to write a cheque with the name Queensland on it, please send it up here. We'll fill in the numbers and that will that will be for satellite communications for full-time, part-time volunteer firefighters and all emergency personnel in Queensland. Thank you. I'll bring that to the Monday night meeting, shall I? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mr Williams. Yeah, look, information flow is the most important aspect uh, of command and control in, in major fire situations. Um, we're going down the modern technology, which is really, really good, but in large parts of the state, that doesn't work. The, the, the UHF radio, the CB radio, is very, very important part of our infrastructure, and, and our service tends to be moving away from that and, and discouraging it. The, the, the most important information you can get is coming from the people on the ground at the fire. Now, we tend to get a lot of information flow down from the top down. They're not so receptive to have information flow from the ground back up. And, and that's extremely, that's where we get back to local knowledge, local respect, letting locals make local decisions on fires. It can't be controlled from a centralised bureaucracy. That's where it starts to fall apart and then bad decisions are made. So communication flow is extremely important. All the technology is good, but remember, in, out in the country, everybody, the councils, the locals, the, the farmers, they all communicate on US, UHF radio. So that, that's most important to keep everybody in the loop. It's all right to send out an app warning people that they're going to be impacted by a fire. Half the people in some of the areas can't get it. They're in a black spot. So the more we can do to improve technology, the better. But we've, we've got to look at a system that encompasses the entire state, not just the areas around the, the populations. Thank you, Mr Williams. You. I appreciate that. And gentlemen, I appreciate your, your time uh, this morning and this afternoon. Uh, it's been very valuable for us. Mr Glover. 
thank you, Commissioners. I will uh, just pause for a moment to see whether there's been any contact made by the parties with leave to appear. Uh, and, Chair, you referred earlier to some evidence from the City of Swan. Um, out of interest, the transcript reference is at nine, page 986 at lines 35 to 42. Um, there appears to be no, uh, uh, nothing from the parties with leave to appear, uh, so that might be an appropriate time to adjourn for lunch. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the Commission, can I thank you, your associations and all the members of your associations for the service to this nation? We appreciate it very, very much. Thank you, and uh, you're excused from your summons. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Greatly you. appreciate it. So we will adjourn until 14.15. Can we handle that? Yes. Yeah, OK. Yes, 45 Chair. minutes and we'll get ourselves back on track on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a really valuable morning and, uh, and appreciate it. Thank you. Let's adjourn. All right.
question has now resumed. Please be seated. Mr Glover, please proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioners, this afternoon we will hear from our final panel of the week. It is a large panel of five volunteers from firefighting brigades across Australia. I call John Stalker, Bruce Forrest, Beth Brains, Peter Bennett and Eric Bulldock. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, Mr. Stalker will be taking an affirmation. Mr. Stalker, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Forrest will take an affirmation. Mr. Forrest, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Ms Raines will also take an affirmation. Ms Raines, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr Bennett will take an oath. Mr Bennett, do you swear by almighty God that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. And finally, Mr. Baldrock will take an affirmation. Mr. Baldock, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Thank you all for your time this afternoon. I would like to ask you each a little bit about yourselves and your brigade. Might I start first with Mr Stalker? Please tell us a little bit about the Samford Rural Fire Brigade and your experience as a volunteer firefighter. Okay, the Sanford Rural Fire Brigade was formed in 1952. It's situated about 21 kilometres outside of the Brisbane CBD. Its area is about 94 square kilometres and we have about 11,000 people living in that area. 35% of our area is classed as very high to high to very high fire risk. We have 87 members. 27 of those are active, and of those active members, eight are female. We have 12 semi-active members who turn out uh, as required. We have 19 support members, nine of those are female. And we currently have 29 people in training. Uh, we have five appliances, ranging from a 4,000 litre heavy attack down to a couple of 600 litre light attacks, and we have a command vehicle. Hmm. Oh, I've just, been in the just rural fire there. service for- Ap Apologies, Mr. Stalker, just stopping there. We heard some evidence this morning that appliances when used in firefighting context refer to vehicles, is that right? Uh, that's correct. Hmm. So when you're talking about those appliances, you're talking about vehicles? That's right. Thank you. Um, please continue about your own personal experience as a volunteer firefighter. I've been in the RFS 16 years. I originally joined at Samson Vale. There I was firefighter, communications officer, treasurer for quite a few years, and also deputy chair. I then transferred to Samford Brigade. I currently focus more on incident control support I do all the fire ground surveying and mapping as we do a large number of um, hazard reduction burns. I was the volunteer community educator for five years and I hope to resume that role in the near future. Thank you. Um, next to Mr Forrest from Beechworth in Victoria, can you please tell us a little bit about the Beechworth Rural Fire Brigade and your experience as a volunteer firefighter? 
Right, yeah, I'm Bruce Forrest. I'm captain of the Beechworth Rural Fire Brigade. I've been a CFA volunteer for about 45 plus years, and my main roles have been firefighter and fire ground commander with some training, um, training component to that. The brigade has approximately 40 active members, which a fifth of those would be female. Um, and some of the, those are some of the most experienced firefighters you'd find anywhere because of what we've had in the area in the last 20 years. Um, our vehicles, appliances, uh, we have a heavy tanker supplied by the CFA, a light tanker that was bought by the brigade, and we're supported by two um, members, private ultralight tankers. Um, so Beechworth is, is a historic tourist town on the Great Divide, which is elevated up on the foothills, I suppose you'd call it the Great Divide. It's surrounded on all sides by the bush or pine forests with some very steep terrain um, and some of it leading into the centre of the town. So that means that at least half the town is classed as extreme fire risk. Um, all the main roads in and out of the town are extreme. So as a firefighter, beach weather is, can be quite challenging at times. Thank you. Um, I'll next move to Ms Raines. Um, please tell us a little bit about the Mount Wilson, Mount Irving uh, Rural Fire Brigade and your experience as a volunteer firefighter. Thank you. Um, so Mount Wilson, Mount Irvine is in the north of the Blue Mountains, um, typical um, Blue Mountains, sandstone, um, lots of uh, cliff lines and um, dry sclerophyll bush, surrounded by National Park. The villages are made up of around about 250 people of about two thirds, which are non-permanent residents who uh, mostly reside and, and work in Sydney. Um, historically, we've had um, major fire events every 10 to 15 years. But of note, we had um, a major fire in um, 2013, State Mine Fire, and now um, Gosper's Mountain Fire in 2019. We have about um, 40 active members on trucks, um, and that is supplemented by another 10 who run um, the station offices to keep um, everything ticking over and um, crews um, organised for the campaign fire. We have another 10 who work in catering and another 10 who are station, uh, uh, um, community engagement people, um, so mainly street coordinators. And their role is to keep um, the community informed um, and that be that conduit between residents and the brigade. And with that, we can get to 100% of our residents. Um, the only exception is that um, if a property's recently changed hands, we might not know about it. Um, the brigade has also got the responsibility um, for motor vehicle accidents, structure fires. We work closely with um, Blue Mountains Fire and Rescue, oh, sorry, Blue Mountains um, um, police rescue for search and rescues um, and also we have a community first responder um, unit which is with New South Wales Ambulance. So when a triple O call is um, required for an ambulance there's a number of us who are first responding to, the, to those properties or to those incidents. Um, I've been a member of the um, brigade since 1999. Before that um, girls weren't encouraged to be on trucks, um, but I became captain in 2008 yep. and have been captain ever since. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll move uh, a little bit um, along the Blue Mountains now to Mr Bennett uh, from Katoomba Lura Rural Fire Brigade. Uh, okay. Um, my name's Fred Bennett. I'm captain of the Katoomba Bushfire Brigade. Uh, I've been captain for the last nine years, but I've been a field officer for the last uh, 43. Um, I joined the brigade officially in 1974. Uh, prior to that, uh, my father was in the brigade and so uh, we were allowed to assist with hazard reductions um, under age back in those days. Uh, our brigade is situated at the top end of um, the Blue Mountains, where uh, we're in the middle of ribbon development from Penrith uh, towards Lithgow, and we have national parks and catchments on both sides to the north and south uh, that can be 
limited tracks crossing over. Uh, if you don't count Mount Wilson, in between it's about 200 to 300 kilometres to the north and so 200 to the south, uh, full of bush. Um, we're situated on the cliff tops and sort of we our uh, the dry chlorophyll forests, uh, hanging swamps, and we also get down into the valleys where we've got the uh, rainforests as well. Uh, our brigade has got uh, about 45 active firefighters, but our membership's 53 with 12 new members, and of that, our uh, female members are 19. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr Bennett, you provided uh, some photographs to the Royal Commission just to show the challenges uh, that exist in the Blue Mountains. Uh, I'd like to show some of them now uh, for you to describe um, the, the scenes we're seeing. So, operator, could you please bring up RCN.900.045.0003, please? And so, Mr. Bennett, I hope you can see that on the screen. Yep. Are you able just to describe yep. what we are looking at, please? Uh, you're looking into the Grace Valley from Evans Lookout. Uh, my task for this particular uh, occasion was to look along the fire. Uh, there's a, a, another couple of photos um, of this set to show the run from the Grace uh, heading east down towards Winmalee and the lower townships on the mountains. Uh, this was able to allow us to ascertain how much time we had and whether we could actually get out and sort of stop it at one of the other fire trails. Uh, so the fires uh, come up out of the valley, you're looking at the southern flank and it disappears towards the east. Thank uh, you. There is no road access into that valley. Okay, thank you. I'm going to show you a picture now of, I think, Wentworth Falls. Operator, can you please bring up RCN.0900. That's it. <laughs> uh, just for completeness, uh, yep. the end of the uh, doc ideas.0004. Uh, Mr. Bennett, can you please just explain or describe what we're seeing in that shot? Uh, this is a, a VLAT run. Uh, this was uh, basically a fortnight after the fires had finished and uh, the valley came back to life and actually crossed over the containment line of, of King's Tableland Road. Um, there's a couple of fire trails that we have run uh, to the east. This had already crossed one of those. Um, the VLAC uh, in our terrain is not overly successive, uh, successful because it hangs up in the high density of our vegetation but it does slow it down. And so for the next four days after this, uh, even though we'd had 100 mil of rain the week before, um, we were back into the, the dicey situation of major townships from Woodford to Wentworth Falls being at risk. Uh, thank you. I'll just show you another picture. Um, it's uh, RCN.0900.045.0001. This also, I think, is Wentworth Falls, Mr. Bennett. Can you just describe what we are seeing here? Uh, this is uh, the Horden Road fire. This goes back to 2015. Um, and this is where it flared up uh, while we we're out fighting this fire. It was a section uh, uh, 44. But uh, what's interesting is that this is protecting the DCA towers for mascot and it, our vegetation has got very high oil content and it flares up and burns extremely hot. Uh, the temperature got down to minus five while we, <laughs> we had icicles forming on the tracks while we are fighting this fire. But it's uh, about three kilometres away from that last shot. Yes, thank you very much. And, and, but except um, five years previously. That's right, that's correct. Thank you. Uh, might that be removed, please, operator? Uh, Mr. Um, Baldock, are you able to describe the Darlington um, Volunteer Fire Brigade for us and also your experience with um, being a volunteer firefighter? The Darlington uh, Volunteer Bushfire Brigade um, 
is in the the uh, is in the Garp of the Darling Range. Um, locally, it's a very high fire risk area with the the slopes. Although they're not as severe as the anywhere near as severe as those in the Blue Mountains, uh, they are challenging at times. And um, the area that we're primarily responsible for has a mixture of urban uh, urban rural interface um, and a number of national parks, such as the John Forrest National Park. Um, and also other reserves uh, in addition to those. Um, the brigade has uh, three uh, permanent vehicles. Oh, a uh, Mr. Mr. Baldock, might I just stop you there? I can show you a picture you provided to the Royal Commission if that assists. Um, our mm -hmm. operator is RCN.900.046.0001. If you're describing the vehicles, these might be them. Is that right? That's that's correct. The vehicle on the right in the picture is our light tanker, the standard uh, type of light tanker. The vehicle in the middle is a 1.4. That's a 1,000 litres with four-wheel drive and a dual cab, as you can see. And our support vehicle um, on the far left, which does a number of jobs, uh, including on occasions being um, incident control vehicles, uh, transport vehicles. Uh, we also have two trailers which are currently out of the station. Um, uh, one uh, with, is a support trailer which basically carries spares and, and a, a, pump, a mobile pump and um, a, also a, um, a, a lighting plant as well. And also a collar tank trailer um, that, uh, that we also use on occasions. The support vehicle and the two trailers were, and the, the station that you can see uh, in the background um, has been essentially put together and, and organised by the brigade members. Uh, the Mundaring Shire uh, is very supportive of the, of the bushfire brigades in the Shire um, and, um, and so we, with the, with the help of the members and getting, raising money and also um, organising uh, grants um, we've been able to uh, get some fairly solid uh, facilities. Um, the brigade itself um, has uh, currently approximately 76 members, of which 51 are firefighters. We have four, uh, 15 trainees currently on hand, uh, 10 um, associates, um, and our females, we have nine females at the moment, which has been fairly steady for a number of years. Six of whom are firefighters and three of our um, uh, associates. Um, Mr. Baldock, um, just, myself, I joined. Mr. Can I just ask you what, 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 who? I was going to ask you what is an associate. I should ask you who is an associate. An associate is someone who is not a firefighter but wishes to support the brigade in some way, and those roles are. Um, from cleaning the bridge, you know, basic stuff like cleaning the station uh, through to um, uh, anything that they can do, and that includes on occasions catering and, and the like. Um, the um, One of those associates is across from the station, so that's been very useful as well. Mm. Okay. And so please the, go on and um, describe your experience as a volunteer firefighter. Yes. Uh, I started with Darlington in 1994 um, and I have, in the time I've been a member of the brigade, I have been uh, the brigade training officer, uh, a team's lieutenant, um, a, the first lieutenant and also the captain. Uh, I'm currently just an ordinary firefighter at the moment um, and have attended many fires over many years. Uh, certainly a lot busier now than what it was when I first joined. Um, the brigade in, in, as I said, in 94. Thank you. Can I just uh, correct Mr Ball? I don't think you should ever refer to anyone as an ordinary firefighter. Personal, personal <laughs> view. I, uh, I take my hat off to all of you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Properly corrected. <laughs> um, so thank you all for that introduction. Um, what I will do now is circle back uh, through you all and ask uh, about whether you experienced intrastate or interstate deployments 
both in terms of deploying to other areas of your state and interstate um, export and import, so to speak. Um, my questions will be primarily directed to the 2019-2020 bushfire season, but if you don't have experience in that season, but experience in previous fire seasons, please let me know. Uh, so, Mr. Stalker, I will start with you. Um, did you experience any deployments in last year? I experienced some deployments intrastate uh, last year, and the brigade um, had substantial deployments both intrastate and interstate. Uh, thank you. Can I show you a picture uh, that you have provided to the Royal Commission? It is RCN.900.045.0005. Uh, so, uh, can you please describe this picture and tell us whether it's a, a deployment in your area or uh, another area? This picture was actually taken at the Kipper Creek fire at Dundas, which is just uh, within four or five kilometres of Mount Glorious Village. And this fire, I think, commenced about seven days previously uh, through a lightning strike and gradually worked its way up through private land and then into the Diagola National Park. And um, at this point in time, they were just starting to get on top of things. I'd actually been there till 2 a.m. that morning. So, um, yeah, that fire was one that was hard to stop. It was extremely steep terrain, uh, heavily wooded, and um, the few times that it looked like it had been contained. It managed to snake across. We had a large bulldozer working there for a couple of days, uh, including late the uh, previous night, uh, trying to cut breaks. So, um, and that's an example of um, how we work closely with uh, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. Thank you. I've got another Thank photo to show, I think, of the same fire. It's the next one along in the sequence operator, it's dot zero 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 six. Is this a different photograph of the same fire, Mr. Stalker? Same same fire, same day. That's on the left is Samford five one, our two thousand litre medium attack, being topped up with water. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so that, Mr. Stalker, I think covers deployments uh, in, um, what about deployments uh, out of your brigade interstate and intrastate in the last fire season? Okay. Uh, commencing with interstate, we had 12 members deployed to fires in New South Wales. Several of those members did multiple deployments as part of uh, various Queensland task forces. In total, 74 person days were involved. Fires attended were in the following areas, Glen Innes, Nowra, Braidwood, Jindon, Tarthra, and in the ACT area. Within Queensland, uh, we deployed to 13 fires outside of our area, and that involved 27 members and 93 person days. Uh, we attended Tiwa Beach, Glenrock, Bribe Island, Brookfield, Kawangba, Perigian Springs, Glenfern, Jimna, Mount Mee, Stanmore, Monseldale, and in the Boona area, and Kipper Creek, where we're currently looking at the photo. Yeah. And so these photographs are an example of an intrastate deployment for your brigade? That's correct. Thank you. Um, we have some photos, I think, uh, that you provided the Royal Commission relating to uh, operations in Nowra. Uh, operator, it'll be the next photograph in the sequence ending dot zero 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 seven. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Mr. Stalker, can you just describe that image for us? Now that image is at the uh, Karawan fire near Nowra, and my colleague uh, George is walking through the area and the three members of our brigade who attended that fire were just 
they just couldn't believe the level of devastation. I mean, we're used to fires up here taking out some of the um, understory, etc. But we're not used to seeing just total annihilation of uh, timberlands. And uh, they're also, um, over, I suppose, really overwhelmed by the intensity of the fires that they encountered down there. Uh, thank you. I'll just show you another picture, I think, of your uh, appliances uh, uh, mustered at uh, Queanbeyan in New South Wales. That photograph ends with dot zero zero one zero. Uh, Mr. Stalker, can you just describe what we're seeing here, please? Yeah, this is uh, the vehicles that belong to one of the Queensland strike teams um, parked at the Queanbeyan RFS depot. So there's obviously there's one, there's four of our um, Queensland vehicles there. Are they in the foreground? Yes, they're, they're the yellow ones. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, 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 Mr. Forrest, I might move to you now and uh, get your experience of deployments into your area in the last fire season. Did you experience any of those? Into, we didn't have any fires close, but we deployed to a lot in, in our state. Um, one of, some of our members went across early in the season to the south coast of New South Wales on a CFA strike team. But our deployments this year were either to the Corrie and Wawa fires up on the border through to Kosciuszko or around the Nug Nug Myrtleford, which was our truck um, manned by our members on 24-7, probably for up to three weeks. We manned the, the vehicles up at either a Corrion, uh, which was a 12-hour changeover, you do a 12-hour shift and then you rotate through. So that was our experience this year, was um, at those two major fires. One's an hour and a half drive and one's a half an hour drive from Beechworth. Thank you. And you have experience of firefighting um, on the border um, in previous years, don't you? Yes, yes, it's, it's always a challenging because um, the radio communications don't work. Um, all you can do is line of sight. Hopefully you've got a UHF radio and the RFS have got a UHF radio and um, you're both on the same channel because the Murray River's between you, but you know, bar getting out and waving at them, or um, there's not much you can really do. So that's probably the most challenging thing with fighting. And we're only half an hour from the border, so we can be involved with a lot of fires on the border. Usually if we're deployed into New South Wales, we go as a strike team. Um, so you have a command vehicle that'll have contact with the local RFS, but then they have to disseminate the messages through to the trucks. Thank you. Um, I'll return to the issue of interoperability a little later, but thank you for those insights. Uh, I think I'm up to Ms Rains. Uh, your area itself was uh, affected pretty badly by the Gospers mountain fire. Um, did you experience any deployments into your area? Yeah, so we had um, extensive RFS help. So we had um, brigades from Hawkesbury, Cumberland, Northern Beaches, um, and many others. Um, we also had fire and rescue come in um, as strike teams. We had um, national parks units come in as well. One of the issues we had with our fire was um, because Gospers Mountain was being run by a different district, not Blue Mountains district, um, Hawkesbury brought in, um, generally speaking, they brought in their divisional commanders um, their, and their management of the fire ground from their Hawkesbury brigades. Um, and, uh, and that just brought some challenges in that um, we weren't familiar with them and they weren't familiar with us. And so there's just those trust issues to start with where they'll rely on and go to the people they know, um, whereas um, you know, that, that local information wasn't necessarily getting through in those initial stages. Um, we quite often, unfortunately, can't return the favour to other brigades and other agencies just because we're such a small brigade. Um, so we generally have a lot of help coming from elsewhere and that has been, um, for every campaign fire, we've had help from, um, you know, we had the Army in 94, we had... Um, ACT parks in 2013. So we always get lots of help up here, which we are hugely appreciative of. Thank you. Um, 
Mr. Bennett, um, you're obviously in an adjacent area to Ms. Rain's brigade. Um, just before I ask you about deployments in and out, is there much interaction between the brigades in your area? Uh, yes, we uh, share the same training base uh, back at uh, the district. Um, and yes, we've been out there numerous times to, to help them uh, as well. Um, at various times, you know, task the, the mountains are such a vast area that you you go where you're told to go. But we we do have a lot of experience in dealing with fire out at Mount Wilson, Mount Tomar, uh, Mount Charles uh, with, with the gross. Because if we don't catch it out there, uh, the problem moves further down east. And uh, so, Mr. Bennett, can I just show you another photo um, of the the Ghost River? Um, it is. I have a photo of it on my yep. screen, but not uh, a doc ID. Yep. It is uh, 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 operator RCN dot zero nine zero zero dot zero four one. It's up. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you just describe what we're seeing uh, here, please? Um, one of my tasks during these last fires was to uh, plot at night. The aircraft couldn't fly and to work out where the fire was at particular times. Uh, there wasn't enough of the uh, LIDAR uh, aircraft flying to plot where the fire paths were. And so they could be hours apart, uh, if not uh, next day. So I was set out to plot this is looking from Perry's Lookdown, one of the lookouts into the Gross Valley. And this is looking at the fire working its way down to the Gross River uh, within the valley. It had already done a run to the west over Darling Causeway into Hartley Valley. And the next day it did its run work to get properties at Dargan. Uh, but this allowed us, was this, sorry, this was the day before the photo that you saw of where I went to the other lookout. At this stage, it hadn't crossed the river. The next day it did, and it had done that run down to the east. So this is looking down around about a uh, 600 metre drop into the valley. Thank you. Uh, now, I should ask you about deployments, um, either from outside into your brigade's area or from your brigade uh, to other areas within the state and outside the state. Uh, we didn't go uh, outside the state this year, but we have previously. Uh, this year, we started following the fires uh, up at uh, Drake. Our truck uh, went up there and, and we lost the truck for six months while it worked its way down. Uh, so we were uh, using other vehicles, uh, makeshift vehicles, uh, in the, the period. Uh, we didn't get our major clients, our Cat 1 truck, back until the, the fires were finished. Can you just tell uh, six us? Months later. Just tell us where Drake is, and so we get an idea uh, of Drake's, how far north it went. Um, it's between Casino and Enterfield, and so uh, we responded a crew from here that drove up uh, straight into the fire and worked that night. So uh, a long, very long day for the, the crew that initially went up, and the the three day deployment that they had. They work extremely hard. Thank you. And then you said that you lost that appliance for six months, so it basically worked its way back down the state uh, chasing yeah, as, as, that, That's correct. Um, after the first uh, few deployments, we, we couldn't supply crews to staff all of the Blue Mountains strike team. And so other districts were then manning our trucks for that period. And so when we finally got it back, uh, it had to have $18,000 worth of repairs done at Gilbert and Roach, and the defects were quite extensive before we were able to get it back to being a working fire truck again. Uh, thank you. Um, finally to you, Mr Bulldock, um, did you have any deployments uh, into your brigade or as I expect, uh, outside, from your brigade, outside to uh, interstate or intrastate? Uh, the, um, the situation uh, locally is that the local uh, neighbouring shires uh, do provide a lot of support for any, any incidents uh, that come up locally. 
Um, we certainly didn't have anything particularly major this uh, this season, um, but uh, in the local sense. But in previous years, we've had people come from all over the the Perth region um, to deal help us assist us with uh, local fires, and that includes uh, uh, parks and wildlife uh, people as well. That mostly because we've got the the national parks involved. Uh, with, uh, deployments uh, interstate. Um, for our brigade members, so we uh, went down to uh, Balladonia. The high, we have, in addition to the three units that I spoke about earlier, we have a what they call a high flush season unit. They, two, uh, this year it was a two four. That's two thousand litres and four wheel drive, and that unit was driven uh, to Balladonia. Um, it's over seven hours um, actual driving um, via um, uh, Kalgoorlie. Which was the major incident control point, and it's about three and a half hours beyond Kalgoorlie. The the we we had people out there virtually the whole time it was out there. That uh, counts for um, uh, ten of our members uh, went out there, and a couple of those actually repeat did repeats. So they went out once, had a few week, couple of weeks off, and then went back out again. Um, for on um, seven day deployments, uh, including a day's travel at each on each end. Um, that accounted for um, 1163 hours of firefighter time. So it was quite a quite a commitment and uh, we were quite pleased to see it come back and yes, it did, did have some damage, um, uh, but uh, not as bad as some of the other units that were out there unfortunately. Interstate, uh, three of us went interstate to New South Wales. Um, two of us, two firefighters went to, worked out of Glen Innes, myself and one other. Um, we spent the five days um, actually fighting fires using the equipment there and uh, mostly um, Category 3 New South Rural Fire Service units and Category 7s. Uh, the hours, oh, sorry, in addition to that, one of our members Spent, um, uh, um, I think it was, uh, I think it was ten days um, uh, over there with uh, working on an airbase. And he's an airbase specialist as one of our um, our uh, specialist uh, areas here. And um, in all, uh, we spent we had uh, 631 hours away on that deployment. Um, uh, into into New South Wales. Thank you. Um, so now, even though we've um, started to discuss issues of interoperability um, with those deployments, I'd like to focus on three areas: um, communications, equipment, and training. So I will um, start with communications and. Uh, what I will do is I'll direct my questions to certain people and then probably ask if the others had similar or different experiences. So with communications, Mr. Stalker, can we start with you? Do you experience or have you had any experience with issues of communications when your brigade is fighting fires? Yes, we have... Um I suppose two major issues. One issue is interoperability and the other issue is coverage. In Queensland, um, the fire service, the police and ambulance all operate off GWN Digital P25. The SES and Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service and our local council, they basically operate off DHF and CBUHF. When you're actually on an incident with those other organisations, it can get extremely awkward in terms of trying to maintain effective communication, especially when you're working up in the hilly country, such as at the fire we showed the picture of earlier at Dundas. You have a lot of black spots. We have particularly a lot of trouble with VHF communication. Uh, GWN, we have really good communication and we can talk extremely clearly to Firecom. But in terms of trying to talk to the other appliances on the fire ground, it gets extremely difficult. 
Um, you showed at the beginning of today a video of a fire and you heard the noise that was generated during that fire. And you've just got a picture that you're, a, you're in a fire scene and what you've got is a very dangerous environment where you've got often difficult terrain, you've got lots of noise coming from both the fire, from vehicles, from a number of sources. You've got heat, you've got poor visibility, you've got wind, you've got dust. Everything that can interfere with communication, you basically have it. And to make it worse then, you not only have to try and communicate with everyone on the fire ground using, say, P25 digital, for some you've got to try and get them on VHF, and for some you're trying to get them on CB. The fire ground also can get very confused in terms of messaging. There's a lot of messaging flowing to and fro. You can have, depends on the structure you have. I mean, you might have a division set up depending on the size of the fire. Within that division, you'll have sectors. Within those particular areas, you'll have lots of intercommunication, communication across. And you're trying to do it with a number of different radio technologies. And it just is extremely difficult and also extremely dangerous and it also doesn't help effective fire management. Yeah, that's, I think that's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, just to return to, is part of the difficulty you experience that some of those other appliances on the fire ground don't use the Queensland government's GWN? That's correct. Uh, with the GWN, firstly, it's only in southeast Queensland. So actually, any rural fire vehicle outside, out of, outside of southeast Queensland doesn't utilise um, GWN. But equally, the SES don't use GWN. So we've had exercises with the SES where we've actually had to borrow some of their radios to help communicate with them. Equally, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, they operate VHF and CB, and Moreton Bay Regional Council operates off VHF. So, yes, we it's extremely hard and it is extremely frustrating and we're not even close to interoperability. Thank you um, for that perspective from an intrastate point of view. I might go to Mr Forrest next, and you've already mentioned your experience uh, fighting fires near the border. Is there anything more you want to share by way of um, your experience in relation to interoperability of communications? Um, in Victoria, I think it, it probably stands out more for us because it worked so well. Mm. After the EMV, I think it was, was formed, uh, after the fires, uh, the radio system has been really good. We have, um, on the fire ground, we have it all set up in the normal system with fire ground channels and communication channels, but we can talk directly to Parks, Firefighter Management and DELP, our other firefighting agencies on the uh, ground, um, and that works really well. Um, you, you run them together or you can talk to each other um, and then if there's something's too, if it gets a bit communicated, communications get too congested uh, in strike teams, well, you'll find that the trucks just revert to talking to each other on just the line of sight UHFs. But no, other than that, the Victorian system, I think that's why when you, you look over the border or look and you think, yeah, well, it doesn't work like ours does. And ours seems to be the standard platform and works really well, uh, bar the odd black spots because we're in the Great Divide, there's always going to be black spots. It's just one of those facts of life. Thank you. Um, I'll go to you, uh, I'll go to Mr. Baldock next, um, because I'm interested in your experience actually deploying into New South Wales. Um, how did you find that experience in relation to communications? Uh, there were two, two main issues. The first one was the I felt that at the when we got our briefing um, initially when we arrived um, that the radio uh, instruction was a little bit um, rushed and uh, we certainly was not when was probably not as confident as what we should have been um, in dealing with that um, well we, we were able to use the radios 
But I think if anything unusual had to come up, we would have struggled to actually um, respond appropriately. The other one was is that, uh, yeah, like you were saying, that, that terrain issue was making communications across, particularly on one of the fires that we were working on, across the, the, the between the two teams that were working on that fire, was very, very difficult indeed. Um, and then we, we have the problem here in Western Australia as well. Uh, granite is a very poor um, uh, penetrate, uh, very poor, very poor when attempting to penetrate radio waves through it. And uh, even you, you can be less than a kilometre away from somebody in another vehicle, and uh, on the other side of a granite um, a rock, and you can't hear anything, or they can't hear you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bulldog. I see. Uh uh, both of the New South Wales uh, uh, witnesses nodding along. Might I go first to Ms Rains? Um, I think you were nodding on in agreement there. Do you uh, just want to share your experience with respect to communications? Yeah, well, I'll... Um uh, uh, Mr. Stalker, I'll just agree with everything he said and um, he articulated it beautifully, so I won't try and emulate that. Um, uh, Probably added to that is um, when when the the um, radio comms get congested, they, there's a tendency to then um, take certain control channels onto a different channel. So, for example, um, the aerial observation and air attack platforms will go onto a different radio channel, um, and they will talk directly to the divisional commander, so the person on the ground who's running running the fire ground. Um, which means that everyone else on that fire ground loses that situational awareness of what's going on. Um, it's a twin-edged um, twin sword because um, you've either got too much radio chatter on one channel or you lose that situational awareness. Yes. Um, the other thing I'd just like to bring up too is um, a lot of our communication issues are more to do with um, communication infrastructure and the um, telecommunications and that's um, predominantly um, Telstra. So we have a um, microwave link between Blackheath and Mount Wilson, um, and that is a um, shed and a glorified caravan in the bush. Um, when the power goes down, um, that facility has got a backup power of about six to eight hours and then fails. And then it is up to someone from the community to notify Telstra to say that their facility is down. Um, so we lose all landline connections, all ADSL um, and all broadband because we don't have, um, that's the only thing we've got available here. Um, compounding that is, um, you know, mobile reception is incredibly bad. Um, so quite often people have to go up the street to be able to get connection to call Telstra to say that their um, their facility is down. Um, and we all know how fun it is talking to Telstra to try and um, put it in complaints. So it's about that um, having, you know, a robust um, fit for purpose and um, well-maintained facility, whether it is, um, you know, towers um, or whether it is, um, you know, exchanges. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I think I saw you nodding along. Do you have a similar experience in Katoomba and Lura? Uh, absolutely. With our uh, topography, we've got a, a lot of steep uh, areas within the townships and sort of with snow at the top end of the mountains, which doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, uh, where uh, we've got broadband to the node, which is five hours, and then it stops. And so uh, we don't know who to go rescue <laughs> uh, when we have the, the worst case conditions. And so uh, our communications from the infrastructure is, is not the best. Uh, it's certainly better than what Beth's got, but uh, it's, it still has its limitations. But uh, from a, a firefighting perspective, we, our area is so vast in the topography, we, we have to count on uh, being situationally aware to deal with the fire that we're, we're faced with on the ground because we may not have any communications once we get out to the site. Um, if we're on the top of the plateau, uh, it's better. But sort of, it's very spasmatic, but once we get down into the valley, uh, we've got to look for high ground to sort of be able to get communication. 
Thank you. And, and that is a function of the topography, though, isn't it? Uh, topography and the vastness of the area and, and the lack of fire trails. You know, it, it's, you, you've really got to look at a map to sort of understand just how vast the area is and how many limited paths there are for, for cutoff points. But sort of understanding and being aware and having seen the sites is so vital for us. Uh, if, if we're excluded by national parks and not allowed to visit, and we get hit with a fire like we did this last year, uh, it's, you're relying on old heads that know the fire paths and know the area to make sure that they're all working in safely, uh, safe areas and, and not putting themselves at risk. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your contributions. Uh, I was proposing to move on to the next topic of equipment, but I'll just check with the commissioners to see whether they had any questions at this stage. No need going to, on to equipment. I do have an equipment and it's an interoperability question. I'll wait till then. But I do have to ask Ms Rains just a, a, a question. It's a follow on. We had the telcos yesterday. Um, noting the significance of that particular facility, telecommunications facility uh, in your area to <coughs> community uh, communication information and also, I guess, for, for firefighting response. How was that facility prepared for the uh, for the bushfire season? It was well prepared, or, or how? It, was, it wasn't prepared at all. So, 2011, we had a pretty catastrophic windstorm here. Um, power was out for uh, probably five days. We highlighted that issue to Telstra about the battery um, backup and it failing after eight hours. Uh, 2013, it happened again. We highlighted the issue yet again to them. Um, and quite frankly, we just get, um, you know, it's it's palmed off and it's a tokenism letter that comes back to us. Um, so it hasn't been maintained. We had a crew go in there before the fire um, and clear, um, well, clear the access to it um, and clear around the, the structure. So we had, you know, um, people out there raking leaves away from it, removing vegetation. Um, and and it, the fire did come up to it, and we had multiple crews over multiple days um, trying to protect that that asset. Um, as firefighters, no problem with us protecting assets. That's what we do. Um, but we shouldn't be out there having to prepare other people's assets, especially um, you know telecommunication companies, which is such a vital link, um, especially during emergencies. No, thank you for that, and thank you for for clarifying it, um, yeah. Mr. Just, Bennett. A just, similar. Um, could, if I could, all right, Commissioner. Could I, if I could just add, yeah. um, just in the last few days, we had uh, correspondence back to them about um, this very issue, um, and their response was, "I'll oh, just buy a satellite phone." So, um, you know, they're not taking it seriously. Um, we, as a community and a brigade, this is very serious to us, but. Um, it just seems that they're not taking it seriously. That's disappointing. Thank you for that, Mr. Bennett. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to add to uh, what you're talking about. Uh, to give you an idea, the railway uh, tunnels that go from uh, Bell down into Lithgow uh, is a, a set of assets. You now, it, it got decimated again this time. It also got decimated 2013. Uh, we regularly do a, a tour to go down and show people uh, the site. We cannot defend their assets. They are too dangerous to get into. We constantly remind them that they need to prepare asset protection zones for their assets. And so it falls on deaf ears. But sort of anybody that's sent into these, these tricky gorges where these tunnels are, um, they're, they're putting their lives at risk and sort of I use it as a, a lesson on where not to go, as opposed to the, the railway saying that they want to show us yeah, where to protect. So that's a, that that's a, a functional railway. Is that the yes the, the it's railway? The main Western railway. It's not line. the zigzag railway that's up. Oh, okay, so it's the main the no, main railway across. It's the main. Okay, so it, again, it's a. Uh, it, it, it's what you're saying is it's a it's a it's a critical asset. That may not be getting the, pre the preparation from the owners that it uh, it, it requires. 
Okay, exactly. thank, thank you. Hadn't even thought about that, but I appreciate you you're raising that. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on. I do have an equipment question, but I think it'll get covered in the next one. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioners. Uh, so um, I'll now move on to um, consideration of interoperability issues with respect to equipment. Uh, Mr Stalker, I uh, might start with you, um, just because you were the first one to speak last time. <laughs> You probably haven't spoken for a little while. Have you had any experience of any uh, challenges with respect to interoperability of equipment? And I'm particularly thinking of interstate deployments. Our, well, our main problem with equipment still gets back down to radio communication. So aside from that, we last fire season Queensland deployed a number of its own appliances to New South Wales. That in itself proved problematic for our firefighters because a number of those vehicles were no longer fit for purpose. We had one particular strike team, uh, it was actually the vehicles uh, pictured in that earlier photo you showed in Queenbeer. Uh, a number of those vehicles had continuous mechanical issues. For example, one of the vehicles could only travel 85 kilometres an hour. Whenever it climbed a hill, it had to do it in first gear. It was finally taken offline in day four. We had a, they had a light attack. They had a dodgy pump when they took delivery of it. It had about 40% pump capacity. Again, it had to be taken offline. One of the vehicles had a flat tyre and it took the tools off three vehicles to be able to change it. The vehicles were sent to New South Wales with only minimum firefighting equipment on them. But basically, as far as I understand, they had the uh, hose reel and pump and a couple of other things. If it wasn't for the well-oiled machine in Queen Bianne with uh, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, who were able to locate and provide appropriate equipment, um, those vehicles wouldn't have been able to achieve much on the fire ground. And the other issue we had with equipment was we actually tried to get more equipment for the brigade to gear up for the fire season last year. And we'd actually put in a request, I think back in um, October, for four non percolating hoses and nozzles, etc. And also for a transfer pump, we have a 12,000 litre boy wall that you use to contain water that's used throughout a um, group area. And we were trying to ensure that we had the appropriate equipment for that to operate. We also asked for a container of foam. The only item we received was the uh, container of foam. And my first officer the other day said he was still trying to negotiate access to the hoses, nozzles and other fittings. So those are our main issues. Thank you. Um, Mr. Forrest uh, from Victoria, um, have you had any experience with um, interoper interoperability uh, with respect to equipment? And again, I'm particularly interested in your perspective of interstate issues. Um, interstate issues um, are usually the radios. Um, previous experience from members has been that the fittings on RFS, which is where we've been deployed to, to New South Wales, uh, fittings on RFS trucks aren't compatible with CFA trucks. May have changed in the last year or two. I haven't been to do it, but when we went there, you couldn't couple up because we had different fittings. And I know our um, truck we've still got now has got a couple of fittings that we call the New South Wales fittings. And we sort of keep them at the back. And as soon as we get to New South Wales, well, they'll come out because they'll connect to their field points or we can go from truck to truck transfers. Mm. Um, but that's the only thing with interstate. We have problems with in, our um, internal equipment, but not with interstate. That's the only thing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bennett, I'll go to you next because I saw you nodding. Um, do you have any experience of uh, the matters Mr. Forrest was just speaking about? Uh, yes. Um, uh, we're using the Storts fitting in New South Wales. Um, there was a, a period where uh, fire and rescue 
introduce a different diameter uh, for their filling points. So we, we carry an adapter uh, for that. But uh, it, that's driven at state level. We're just told what to, to use. And so as far as any change goes, uh, we haven't changed since we went away from the screw threads. Uh, and that's going back 35 odd years ago. Um, so since then, uh, it's, it's just become standard for New South Wales. Uh, as far as gear goes, um, a lot of the gear goes missing once once your truck's away and you don't have a caretaker with it. Um, we're still missing a chainsaw that is somewhere up north. So, uh, and, and that's coming up now for, what, 10 months. Thank you. So, uh, um, thank you. Uh, Miss Rains, uh, did you have any insights on this topic that you'd like to share? Probably just the only thing is um, fire and rescue tend to use a much larger fitting than what RFS have on stock. So if they're requiring to draft out of a large water supply, they might need an adapter. And it's something that we as RFS brigades don't necessarily carry, depending on the size of the truck. Um, because our brigade does actually have a pumper, we do have a large um, fitting, so we we're able to lend that out. And thankfully it came back. Um, probably just another issue, and that's an um, inter-RFS um, issue, is one of their brand new fire appliances, which is a Land Cruiser. Um, the only way you can fill it is with a storch fitting. So a hose that's got a storch fitting attached. So there's no way of being able to put a garden hose in the top of it. So these vehicles are designed to be agile and get around the back of people's properties. But it's a bit useless if you can't fill them up. Um, so that's just just a little niggle. Thank you. Um, finally, Mr. Bulldog, I'll just ask you if you have any insights in relation to this topic. Yeah, like everybody else, our, our fittings are largely different. We use uh, BIC uh, fittings uh, uh, for our larger di diameter uh, hoses and uh, storts for the smaller ones. Um, so essentially, like them, it, we, we don't have that um, ability to operate with other other equipment. Uh, if, if somebody decided that they needed to send West Australian units over to this, they'd have to operate together. Um, certainly when we were at Van Innes, unlike the radio induction, the induction to the vehicle and the opportunity that we had to uh, practice with it uh, certainly got us familiar and, um, and, and uh, we were quite happy uh, using it. Um, the, they were different, the, the, the branches, the nozzles were different, um, the pumping, the arrangements were different, but they were very, very clearly explained to us. Thank you. Um, now, I've just got a question for everyone, so I'll go around the group again. So when equipment is shared, who is responsible for dispatching it and then returning it? Is it your brigade or is there some um, coordinating body that does that? So, Mr. Stalker, I'll start with you, please. My understanding is that, uh, for example, we're in appliances uh, uh, loaned out to another area where there's a fire. It's the actual, I presume it'd be the regional office where that's undertaken. For example, at the Monsendale fire, uh, Sanford 5 1 was used up there for about a week. Uh, and they had crews down from North Queensland. Because, again, we've purchased four of our own vehicles and designed them through fundraising, we don't want to see them uh, trashed. So we ensured that one of our members was available to drive the vehicle each day, just to safeguard the asset. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Forrest? Um... Um, ours all comes under the CFA, so our vehicles are deployed by the CFA uh, maintained by the CFA, uh, but some of the brigade owned vehicles, which they have to ask permission to use. Um, but it's all, and if it comes back, it's all repaired to the standard before it, uh, it left. So if anything's broken, anything's lost, uh, we lost a quick fill pump for three months, I think it turned up, but it would have been replaced by the CFA if it couldn't have been found. So that's not really an issue for us. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Raines? Um, so, very same with um, Mr. Forrest. Um, 
if um if you do lend a vehicle, um, it um generally comes back and might be missing a few bits of equipment. Um, I know after two thousand and thirteen, we had some um, storched cam lock adapters that um mysteriously disappeared down to a southern state. Um, and so be it. And so, Mr. Bennett, you were the one who. Uh, uh, precipitated my question with the missing chainsaw. Uh, what's your experience in relation to this issue? Uh, the truck uh, departs fully stocked um, as, a, as a fully stocked appliance to apply to the where we're going. We may throw some extra fuel on uh, if we're going out west um, or up north. So uh, a couple of jerry cans, things like that. Uh, GPS, um, all those things that we would normally use are, are in the truck as standard. Um, when it comes back, it's missing. We put in a requisition to the district office and they will apply back through the state to get uh, reimbursed. But uh, it's disappointing that um, we didn't have our appliance for the, this season um, after September. And when it came back, we, we were sort of quite disappointed about the state of the vehicle. Thank you. Uh, finally to you, Mr Baldock, uh, in Western Australia, uh, what's your understanding of how that uh, equipment sharing or responsibility for dispatch and return works in Western Australia? Well, so, uh, for, for inter interstate uh, deployments, it's almost always uh, DFIS that will, uh, Department of Fire and Registry Services, that will uh, organise the, uh, the deployment. Uh, certainly that was the case in Baladonia. Um, the vehicles were, the, the various guys were asked to nominate vehicles and they were uh, sent out there. Um, the damage, uh, because of the major, it's a major incident, that damage, then there was some serious damage in one of the vehicles. Um, not one of ours, but uh, one of the other vehicles that was sent out to Baladonia had an argument with a uh, West Tail Eagle and uh, broke its front windscreen. Um, we lost a lot of tyres. And uh, getting back to one of our, our previous uh, questions that uh, just reminded me, um, the, the idea of supporting units in the field is something that was, is, I think, needs perhaps needs a bit of attention. Uh, Baladonia, we lost a lot of flat tyres due to uh, stakes in the ground, um, uh, hidden in the dust. Uh, there was a lot of dust out there. And um, yeah, we, were, we were, had a number of units that had to sit uh, back with, without any spare. Um, and in one case, uh, one spare and one of the duels in the back flat. So they had to stay at base until such time as um, tyres were brought forward. So that's, a, that's an aspect of it, not, not just the, the, uh, the, 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 the equipment interoperability but also its support of that equipment um, and that, I might add that at Baladonia we actually had two DFIS uh, technicians there um, sorting out the, 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 the incredible amount of dust that was involved so um, yes yeah, so a long distance support like that is, is, is quite critical as well so trying to trying to fix the damage when it's first noticed rather than um, leave it all till later and perhaps drive a vehicle which we shouldn't be out there in. Mm. Now, Mr. Bennett, you had a question. Oh, you had a comment to make. Uh, absolutely, uh, I support those comments. Uh, absolutely, uh, up in Drake, uh, we're travelling 150 odd kilometres back to base. Um, it's not good when the truck breaks down and you've actually got to light up around it to protect the crew. And that happened up there with breakdowns because of lack of service, the dust uh, and everything else. We're getting back late. There wasn't time to service the air filters and things like that. The trucks are being well and truly abused and, and not the services only on the breakdown, not on preventative. And it's something that really needs to happen, particularly on these remote area fires. Thank you. Uh, Can you up at Penderfield, it, it's, it was... Tenerfield and Casino couldn't support the amount of vehicles that were there to, every night. It was just impossible. Mm. And, and you referred to lighting up around the vehicle. Just for the Commission's um, assistance, can you just please describe uh, for us what that means? Getting a drip torch off the truck 
and lighting around the truck to burning the immediate area and then putting the, the fire out before it gets to the truck itself and let it burn back towards the fire. Um, it's a last resort, but sort of the other crews, by the time they got back in uh, to give assistance, uh, they had already sort of looked after themselves in that way. But it, it's, it's tricky and it's not something that you want to have as your first choice. Thank you. Um, noting the time, um, I, I might move on from equipment there. So I might just ask the chair if he has a question. I've, I've got a question other commissioners might as well. And, and, it, and I'll start with Mr Bennett from a New South, New South Wales point of view, but I'd be interested as we go around the, the, the room. We talk about intrastate deployments. We talked about, sorry, interstate deployments and uh, interoperability, commonality. Mr Bennett, if, we, uh, if you went from Katoomba and you went up north to drive someone else's truck, and I'm just, sorry, I can't put it up, it's a Google, but I'm just looking at uh, what a Category 1 truck is. When you're in a Category yeah. 1 truck in Katoomba, you go up to Glen Innes or Casino or you go down to down south and you jump into a Cat 1 truck there, are they the same configuration? Like you jump in it's, and you, you go, or are there different issues? Yeah, yeah, look, there's there's nuances between the issues of the trucks, mm -hmm. but sort of it, it, any firefighter working salt knows which ends of the wet end uh, of the truck, how the pump works, and as soon as you do a handover, you're going to grab hold of somebody that's going to point out those issues. You, your driver is going to jump in and look at the gearbox and sort of, you know, what's the go with uh, that, and your crew leader is going to look at communications. So they're the sort of things that come in very quickly on a handover if we fly in and get on somebody else's truck. Okay. And so the truck will have uh, the same roll protection, I think it's called a halo system no. and all that? No, no, it won't? No, no, not at all. Why? Uh, our, our truck doesn't have a halo. Uh, it's too old. Our, our truck's 21 uh, years old now. And so it, it's only got what I call the, the umbrella style sprinkler system. Hmm. And anybody that's been in a major fire knows that the wind that the fire generates blows that hail, that umbrella about 30 metres to the side of the track, not on the track. Okay. So, yeah, my favourite lo uh, thing is location, location, location. I tell my crew all the time, make sure that you're in the best position if you're in an overrun. Because the sprinkler system isn't going to protect <laughs> the whole cab. Mm -hmm. There's the wheel arch sprays that we do have is going to protect the brakes and things like that to allow you to move into a better position. Okay, and I guess that this is a, a state issue, but just out of interest, how, uh, from a commonality point of view, what's the percentage of fleet that have all that latest equipment vice the the older trucks that don't have that, that equipment? Um, at a guess, I think the halo bars were introduced about five years ago. Yeah. Um, if they're doing 100 or, or, or I forget, 90 trucks a year, um, that'll give you an indication out of the fleet of over 2,000. So it's not a high percentage. Uh, it's something that we've been pushing since this season, that sort of any spare money that's around, bring all the trucks up to the halo bar uh, protection cab, roll protection, uh, and that's what the, the RFS is currently looking into right now. Okay. And, and so if you've only got vehicles of that, so many vehicles of that standard, do are there internal uh, state decisions to move those vehicles to the highest risk areas if uh, in, a, in a season? No. No? Okay. No, it, like, it, it's who's available. It, it's a rotation sort of thing. Uh, our time came up as a, the next one to go out of area, mm -hmm. uh, any, anywhere in the state. So uh, we went out to Lidsdale, uh, fortnight earlier to fight the fires out west and, and then sort of back in and then the next crew, yeah, have we got another crew that can do a, 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 a RRG, mm -hmm. uh, which is the, uh, you know, a, a multiple day commitment. And so we set our track and sort of it was just available with the crew to get out there and do what they can straight up. Okay, thank you very much. Mr Forrest, from Victoria's point of view, if you, you move around to to share equipment or you end up with a vehicle coming to you, 
is it a, a standard configuration, not just in a radios and where the hoses are and the on the the water end of it, but with protections and the uh, and the like? Yes, it's it's been standardised um, really well with the burnover. We call it burnover. This is when the fire. Um, the, the truck locks down and, and the sprays come on. We call it a burnover system. They're standardised with them, so the light, medium, and heavy tankers will all have that. They're all basically the same. They might be a different brand. That's about the only difference. So that works well. The only ones that don't have the burnover at the moment are the small. We call them ultralight tankers, which are land cruiser based. But we found in our state what's gone wrong is they've standardised too much. So um, I call them the flatland truck and the hill country trucks. So I'll give you an example. We got a new half a million dollar truck early this year um, with the wrong style gearbox and it wasn't suited for the hill country. Um, so we handed it back to the CFA, unanimously voted by the members, and took a 10 year old truck from another. Just because the standardisation has gone too far. Um, a truck that suits the Wimmera, the Mallee, you can understand, doesn't work in the, in the Alpine areas. So that's probably the biggest problem we have with, with the vehicles. Um, allocation is another thing, but that's another matter. But everything else is the same. Um, they basically have got four vehicles, um, and you can hop on any of them bar the fact that it might be a different brand. Um, no, they are standardised with that. So standardised with, um, with the protections and the, and the like for the, for yes, the crew? Yes. They, they have a rollover system, and they have, I think, from what Peter said, he called it the halo, not the umbrella. Ours have got... The sprays that go right around the outside of the truck. Yeah. When you put it on, you, the truck looks like it's buried in the fog, and that system works really that well. So all the trucks, thing, bar imagine. the smallest ones, have got it. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Baldock. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the uh, the the uh, border protection. Oh, sorry. All of the uh, drop down curtains and all that. They're all standard across of all of our uh, firefighting vehicles. Um, not all vehicles have any kind of water protection in Western Australia, but I believe that's where all new ones will have them, except the light tankers, the, the Land Cruiser-based vehicles. Uh, we don't have enough water for that, seeing so use their agility as, and to get them out of uh, out of trouble if, if necessary. Um, the, 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 the only variations come on is some of the builds, some of the older builds are slightly different. But by and large, the location of all the, the bits and pieces are, are pretty standard um, across uh, across the units. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Raines. Have you got anything to add from a from a New South Wales pers perspective, or is it a similar view to Mr. Bennett? Yeah, Peter, uh, Mr. Bennett's covered it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Stalker, I understand Queensland is a different model, but a, a similar question to you as well about the standardisation. Can you go and use someone else's vehicle and expect the configuration to be roughly the same? Levels of protection and, uh, and the like. I can't claim to be an expert on uh, our fleet, but basically they use similar designs and obviously um, the age of the vehicle is going to impact on um, what capacity it has. Um, I must admit, our brigade has always funded and designed its own vehicles to suit our particular environment. Um, though, yeah, we're just a little bit different than, um, I suppose, the standard vehicles that are issued across Queensland. Okay. Do you have to meet it because you do that? Is there a, a protection standard that you need to meet when you design your particular vehicles? Yes, there is, and we ensure that that's um, up to scratch in our vehicles. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you're... I mean, uh, we can... Pull. Sorry. No, please, continue. Actually, I've lost my train of thought now, sorry. No, I was talking about... That was my fault. Um, we're, we're talking about levels of protection for the, for the crew. Is there a standard that when you design a vehicle, acknowledging that you've got different conditions, as Mr Forrest said, but... If you're designing a vehicle for your particular RFS uh, area, you might have different shapes and sizes and the and the like. But is there a level of uh, protection that must be met in whatever you design, like a halo system or a blinds or or whatever? We, yes, we, we have the we have the blinds, etc. Uh, we don't have the halo system. Um, we always ensure there's a certain percentage of uh, water left in the tank for um, protection. 
Um, that's about it. I mean, I suppose in part the the Queensland environment and the type of fires that we typically encounter aren't quite the same as what the um, southern states encounter. No, and no, I appreciate that. And you had that in your evidence early on with that uh, that Nara fire. Now, thank you very much for that. It was good to get some insight and good for background for, for us. Mr Glover, please continue. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the last topic uh, I'd like to discuss from an interoperability point of view is training. Uh, so I will go around the group again, but I'd just like to ask you the same general question, but this time with respect to training. So um, are there any issues or challenges to interoperability arising out of training received by volunteer firefighters? Mr. Stalker, I'll start with you, please. Okay. Within uh, Queensland Fire and Emergency Service and the Rural Fire Service, I suppose there's a mixture of both accredited training and non-accredited training. So there are some elements of training delivered that can directly equate to the public safety training package. There are other elements that have been designed and developed specifically for Queensland use, such as the firefighter minimum skills process that all beginner firefighters have to go through. I think that was first put together back in 2006 and it's been modified over time. We have been advised, even though it's informally, and we haven't been told officially, we understand that there's a, a new training curriculum currently under development, which will ensure that all training, as far as we understand, delivered in Queensland will fully meet uh, components of the public safety package. And that's the nationally accredited um, training? That's correct. Thank you. Although, um, although we haven't had that confirmed, we've just been made aware that um, something's happening to that effect. Thank you for your answer. Uh, Mr Forrest, um, from your perspective in the Beechworth Rural um, Fire Brigade, um, have you experienced any issues with interoperability in relation to training that's provided to volunteer firefighters? Mm, yeah, all the firefighters before they're allowed on the fire ground uh, to do a minimum skills, which is the CFO based, got a new name, which I can't remember, minimum skills. So that everybody gets a basic training of how this works, that works, and, and then brigade members run them through it. Um, it's the additional training that probably is a bit lacking, but that comes down to a statewide. We find it very hard because of our terrain. We really should all have four drive truck training course because um, 12 to 15 tonne truck in some of the conditions we put them in really needs training. But because it's not a statewide uh, priority, because a lot of the state doesn't need four wheel drive training in the steep country, it seems to be a little bit neglected. As somebody sending people out in a fire truck for fire responsibility centre, sometimes I have issues with that because of the fact I think, well, you ask and ask about um, And that's probably the main one. There's other smaller issues, but the four wheel drive truck training. To let somebody loose in a 15 tonne truck in some of our terrain, um, they really need to be a minimum of uh, have done the two and a half, three day course. So do, does your brigade deliver any training in that respect? Or when you talk about the two or three day course, that's the course that yes. is provided by the CFA? Yes, um, I've done it um, and some of the members have, and we often, um, I suppose to say, mentor the drivers on a fire ground if we can. And we have a, a, one of the members has a hill that's quite safe to do some training on. Um, and we take them out there and run them through that when we can, just to give them a basic idea of um, it's not the same as driving on the road. And some of these people have just got their truck license. So that's what we do to sort of compensate for the official one. And hopefully as the wheels move slowly that we'll be able to get more training in that department. Thank you. Um, Miss Rains, what's your experience uh, from a New South Wales perspective? So I'm particularly interested in any issues you've encountered with interoperability with respect to training of volunteer firefighters. Um, so, first of 
for us, um, we find there's a lot of difference between different agencies um, and their experience and their opportunity to put that training into practice. Um, and that will range from people's definition of mopping up. Um, so that will go from someone standing on a road spraying as far as they can reach with a hose to people actually walking in um, and, you know, turning over logs, scraping them out um, and, and dropping dangerous trees that are burning up high. So that's one issue and, and I guess it comes down to experience and opportunity. So some agencies don't necessarily get the opportunity to go out and learn that. Um, quite often, um, our, a lot of the training is conducted on hazard reductions. Um, so, for example, mopping up and, and um, lighting up techniques. They're really the only ways you can teach someone how to do those activities. Um, and there's a tendency to have um, different agencies working in the same group. So you'll have Fire and Rescue looking after a sector and you'll have National Parks looking after a sector and RFS looking after a sector. So there's not that um, that cross of information and technique um, that there could be. And I think that's important. The other thing is it is really hard to teach um, drip torch techniques if you don't have a fire. And if you can't do hazard reductions, so, you know, we've been burnt out all around us, so we can't do hazard reductions for seven years. Um, and that's our prime opportunity to teach people um, mopping up and, and lighting up techniques. And if we can't do that, how do you teach that? It'd be great if there was some kind of package um, developed. Um, I know Mr Bennett's got um, one that he uses in his brigade, which is, which is great, but um, I think a lot of brigades and different agencies would benefit from that. Thank you, Ms Raines, for that answer. I might, on that note, I will throw to Mr Bennett. Um, I suppose my question might be a little more specific, but feel fr free to answer the more general question. Um, I think it's obvious from what Ms Raines said that you deliver some sort of brigade level training in relation to uh, drip burning. Are you able to just explain to the commissioners what that is and how you came to develop that training package? Um, it was a, in Australia, uh, the drip torch is invented by the cane farms originally, and it's been a widely used tool around Australia. With General Bushman and the understanding of how to use fire, that was part of our history. But nowadays, we've got more people that are coming in without uh, a bushcraft into the services and therefore they've not got that natural uh, ability and need to be taught. I found this sort of 30 years ago when I asked somebody to you know, deepen a burn and they didn't know how to do it. So I started jotting down notes and so since then I've been, it's now a multi-page document of lighting techniques. Um, what I've found is with going into state with going into other areas, the adaptability and the understanding of how to use fire and how quick a crew can adapt can be the difference between saving it and not saving it. And so our terrain is so difficult, it's very unforgiving for mistakes. Whereas other crews coming in don't tend to sort of have that same appreciation, particularly if they're flatland style firefighters. Uh, having to educate fire and rescue when they come in is the challenge for me as a sector leader to make sure that they start to learn the right approach to lighting. Thank and so uh, that's my be my role. Yeah, thank you for that uh, answer, Mr. Forrest. I saw you uh, nodding along. Then is that your experience in similarly, uh, you know, mountainous topography in Beechworth? Yes, it is. Um, it's a it's a acquired art and really you can only acquire the art by practice yeah. um so unless you can get some private burns which we try and do for people um yes it's something that's it needs a lot of mentoring and a lot of teaching so it's something that really should be practiced because it can make or break a fire if you can get a, a good drip torch line put in and the uh, back burn as we call it done um it's worth its weight in gold thank you uh, mr baldock just to round off the issue of training. I'll ask you the same general question, um, which is, have you experienced any issues with respect to interoperability relating to training of 
volunteer firefighters? Uh, not, uh, not particularly. The, uh, there is a standard uh, here in Western Australia for the vast majority of firefighters um, that I interact, interact with uh, do uh, for, you know, when they first join. Um, most brigades around the Perth region particularly uh, have uh, uh, pretty good opportunities to um, conduct hazard reduction burns of various different sizes from single brigade right to, through to multi-brigade uh, um, uh, hazard reduction burns. So that's really very, very useful. Um, the, only, the only weakness that we have um, here um, is the, that I would see is the se severe terrain training. We just don't have that here um, to any great degree. And so consequently, we're not experienced in that area. Um, we spend quite a bit of time down what we call the flats. That's the, the sand plain around Perth um, requires. And you learn very quickly after getting yourself bogged a few times to drive appropriately on what is very deep sand. Um, but then again, you come up to the hills um, less than a kilometre away and you're having to dodge uh, granite boulders. So there's, a, there's always, a, we, we, we have a, a fair variety. Uh, and so people tend to get up to speed, but that ability to do hazard reduction burns is a really important part of our training and maintaining our, tra our skills um, as well. Uh, you assisted um, with the training of your brigade by being located in a local government area that has a training school located within it? Yes, we do. The Mundaring uh, fire, fire, fire School is uh, uh, trained to me. It was um, in its absolute infancy when I joined back in 94. I can't remember when the school actually started. Um, and it was a number of very um, senior and experienced firefighters in the, in, the, in the Shire got together because they realised that some of the uh, brigade located training was not up to scratch. And uh, it is a very, very well respected and extremely professional uh, volunteer uh, um, uh, group that puts it together. I'm actually in the process. I've actually have spent some time there. Uh, back when I was a brigade training officer, I did uh, involve myself in some of the training they did. Um, but when I went into uh, officers, uh, skill, uh, senior officers in the brigade, I took a break. But in the future, I intend going back there. And, and I'm really looking forward to it because of the uh, incredible uh, work that they, they do in ensuring that um, people are trained by people who have enormous amounts of ex practical experience uh, on the fire ground. And that is, a, that is one of its very good strengths. The other, just on that topic, we don't just train uh, firefighters in the show of Mundaring. Um, we have the ability to train anybody who's trying to get training done. Uh, we've got a space, we'll offer it. And vice versa, if the other local, uh, local governments have got spare spaces and we've got people who've missed out on one of our training uh, sessions, uh, they can go and uh, uh, there's arrangements through DFIS who, who coordinate this um, uh, and, and get it, uh, get their, their, particularly with the initial stuff uh, done. But we also have a lot of development programs that, uh, training programs that, are, that occur, and that includes um, the, the four wheel driving, and some of these get very heavily um, uh, subscribed to. Um, but the, most people who want them usually can eventually get them onto those courses. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, oh, Mr. Stalker, did you have a comment? Yes, I do. I was just going to say, apart from the uh, training that's uh, structured and organised by the uh, RFS, we also do our own in-house training. Like we have a training uh, three Wednesday nights a week. We cover everything from chainsaw for jive, you name it, a lot of refresher courses. But we also are fortunate that we are able to do a lot of large hazard reduction burns. Uh, up until recent years, we used to do the fire management for the uh, training area at Inogra Army Base. So that gave us 460 hectares to um, look after and that provided a lot of training opportunities. Recently, we've also been asked to uh, look after an 1100 acre block that hasn't been touched for years. It's up in the high country. It's uh, extremely tetra difficult terrain. And we're actually now in the process of organising live exercises for training that will involve 
uh, three local brigades. It will involve Parks and Wildlife Service and it will involve the local council. And we reckon we've got quite a few years worth of training to undertake in that property to um, get it back under control. Thank you. Thank you. And you said um, in relation to the Inogra Army Base, you uh, did that back, uh, did that had a hazard reduction burning up until recently. Do I take from that answer you don't do it anymore? No, we, we the brigade looked after it for about um, 30 years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Defence then decided to um, put it out the contract. Uh, we were, didn't receive the support to um, enter a contract, so we could no longer undertake that, which is a shame because all the vehicle builds that we've undertaken in recent years has been largely funded through the work we undertook, which involves a hell of a lot of time from members. And uh, that's on top of uh, your normal training and any other fire commitments you have. So the brigade members invested an enormous number of hours over the years just to try and ensure that the brigade was best situated to protect our community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just noting the time, um, Commissioners, that concludes my questions on training um, and indeed concludes my questions for this panel. Commissioner Bennett's just got one training question, which I think is more focused around New South Wales. Yes, it is. It is. It's, a, it's really addressed to New South Wales. Bearing in mind um, what you said about the difficulties of getting training in the art, um, which requires the hands-on experience, and hearing what the um, what Mr. Baldock and Mr. Stalker said, I mean, is there any provision for um, having having uh, firefighters go either across the state or interstate if necessary? to be able to get that hands-on training? Uh, it's, it's very different. Um, basically, uh, every community has their approach to burning. And so it's it's pulling all of those, uh, that knowledge into a base. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of very happy to sort of look at mountains. I'm, that's my forte. Don't put me in the grasslands. <laughs> it scares the hell out of me um, because it, it's, it's a very different way, a different approach to it, and you're using fire to counteract the fire. So low intensity at the edge, and sort of as it gets further in on, on a bad day, it can go fire cumulus, but you, you've satisfied the criteria of creating safe edge with the crews and the assets that you've got. I should have I should have prefaced the question because I was thinking thinking about of course topography is different, and of course there are unique you know you, there are unique lo, there's unique no, local knowledge that you need for the areas under your control, but isn't some training or experience in not perhaps identical but similar topography better than none? Oh, absolutely. I uh, I was asked to put a proposal forward to CSIRO to get the drip torch, uh, the viscosity of the fuel, the type of mix that we use for our drip torch fuel to, to try and pull that together. Uh, I just haven't had time, uh, being captain, I just, it's been an impossibility to sort of sit down and write that proposal. But to pull the state's fuel, e even in the state, the mixes that we're using uh, and some of the mixes that we've been forced to use aren't necessarily the right mix for the tool. And so we've either got to adapt the tool or adapt the fuel and sort of that's where it can, it's understanding how to adapt the tool that can give you some nuances, uh, particularly for safety. And I, I did research into the fuels uh, back, uh, going back 10 years ago and um, I can't change the my document because if I do, I've got to take the fuels out of it because I don't meet the current uh, mix that they're recommending. And I'm afraid the information I've got in there is more valuable from a safety aspect than to change and take that out. So I've left the document as it is. Thank you. Ms. Rains, did you have anything to add to that? I find um, <clears throat> to actually undertake a training burn, there's just a lot of bureaucracy behind it. 
um, yes, you can do it, but most of the time it's just too painful to go through the process so you don't, so you just go through theory and then learn out on a hazard reduction or a fire. So I'd love to see, you know, small blocks of land that possibly, you know, we're only talking, you know, they could be really small, um, that could be set aside for, for doing a training burn specifically for lighting up techniques and mopping up techniques. And then you could get potentially, you know, brigades from the same district or from surrounding districts to come in and assist. Um, and so it would be, you know, it's a, it's a in the field laboratory, if you want to call it something, um, but, you know, it's, it's in the field training. A bit like what Mr Stalker was talking about, that he was had the advantage of doing up, up in his part. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, that's a lost opportunity as far as I'm concerned. I'm um, sorry to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Mr Bennett, and then Mr Stalker. Uh, what I was going to say is, uh, as the strike teams come in out of area and you've got the opportunity as a sector leader to tell them what you want them to do, uh, time and time again, I get the comments back that they didn't realise that you could use the tool that way. Uh, it's, it's a more understanding of how to apply the fire to get out of it what you want. And so it's not just going in willy-nilly and just going fire on the ground. It's about sort of cleaning it and sort of adapting it to the conditions and the different types of vegetation that you've got. Vegetation is just as important as your, your fuel moisture content and your topography. They're, they're the factors that come into play. And so you, you will adapt according to what you do. And that combination, uh, that the knowledge about that combination comes from local knowledge, doesn't it? Uh, there's a basic knowledge that you bring out of the advanced firefighter course, but then you, you need to apply it on the ground. And so I'll, I'll teach any crew that I've got around me uh, to show them what to do. Thank you. Mr Stalker, I think you wanted to add something. Yes, I was just going to say, unlike New South Wales, which seems to have a very centralised control over undertaking hazard reduction, in Queensland, ours is obviously a community, a local level approach, which is based around having fire wardens in particular areas in the community, and those fire wardens are responsible for assessing and issuing fire permits. So we were able to look at um, our own particular community, work out where we believe the most risk is, and if it's on public land, for example, controlled by council or parks, we can work with them to undertake the appropriate action. Or if we think there's a, a range of privately owned properties, uh, we can approach those property owners or they will approach us, as is the case in the past week, where we've had a group of property owners approach the fire service and say, we would like uh, you to come in and undertake a hazard reduction burn on our neighbouring properties. So that's able to be organised at a local level and managed at the local level, and it works very well. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that assistance. Uh, thank you. Appreciate uh, appreciate that. We just want to take a pause. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we will just check whether any of the parties with leave to appear have made contact. I'm being told they have not, so have might the witnesses be released from their summonses? Yes, they may, but before they go, on behalf of the Commission, can I thank you and your brigades for the service that you do for your communities, uh, often in pretty horrendous conditions, uh, and often at times where everyone else is taking time off. So uh, uh, on behalf of us, thank you for what you do, and if you could pass it on to your brigades as well, we appreciate it, and you are released from your summons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. We should now adjourn until Monday. Despite our best efforts, you got us back on track for time, Mr Glover. Good job. We will adjourn to 10 o'clock Canberra time on Monday. Thank you. <laughs>